episode number 16 of Behind the Sport. How are you doing tonight, Brent? Oh, I'm good, man. I'm stoked to be here. Happy as. Um, got plenty on the go at the moment. And uh, yeah, just genuinely pumped. My normal happy self. Sweet. Um, well, look, today's guest uh, is not a competitor. Is not involved in the admin side of things of the sport. He is involved in media. He's photographed over 500 Formula One Grand Prix. Uh, he was around in the Ayrton Senna versus Prost era, uh, the Schumacher era, the Red Bull uh, slash Vettel dominance era, and of course, still photographing now in the Mercedes Hamilton dominated era. Uh, he has captured some of the most iconic images of Formula One. Uh, the flying fin, um, some Ayrton Senna photos, which are used still to this day. Uh, and his name is Mark Sutton, uh, the founder of Sutton Images. And he will be joining us to have a chat about everything photography in motorsport and a bit of F1. <laughs> Thanks for joining us uh, today. Um, early time over there for you but uh late mid evening for us how are you going today mark i'm very well yeah it's only five to eleven it's not too bad i didn't just get up by the way <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm usually obviously working from home um i try and get into a routine of my, my my family's actually all working so my, my my wife's working at the hospital my kids work locally so they're pretty much out by nine so i'm, I'm pretty much up 8 30 and shower change and get ready yesterday I got up a little bit earlier, went to the circuit just to get my COVID test. So the, the usual down the throat and in the nose, not very nice experience, but um, we're lucky that we've got this Eurofins that are doing the, all the testing for Formula One and FIA. So they're now based again at, back at Silverstone. So before we went to Austria for the first race, we had that test to make sure we could go on the flight and fly to Austria and obviously has to come back negative. And then we take that letter with us to Austria and then, so on, so on, and every five days we get tested. So that's how it's been working. But I couldn't go in the track yesterday. I, I, want, I desperately wanted to go in and just do a few pictures, but um, they want to try and make sure that everyone's within the confines and make sure everyone's been tested before they go in the circuit. So I've got to wait for my result to come back. And really they don't want the media going in until Thursday. So I'll, I'll adhere to that. I mean, I'm just lucky to be there. I know you might see everyone's a bit flippant about being there, but I'm just glad to be there really, to be honest, because obviously, there is big restrictions and it's only a select amount of, there's about 20 photographers actually working outside the track. And then there's, there's sort of, I guess, five or six that are working within the team. So they work with the team, they eat with the team, sleep and stay within the team sort of bubbles as they call it. And um, so some are photographers, some are photo journal, uh, photo video guys. So they take the stills from the video or they, they'll shoot a, a still having shot the video so um, some teams have incorporated that they don't want too many people in the garage I think that's what the philosophy is um, so that's yeah. really what's happening and I obviously have done the first three races I was in Australia obviously uh, as you know um, and that was a bit sad but um, I still did like four days work I mean I don't know how I did it but <laughs> I was there on the Tuesday so I picked up my permanent pass which is here so my permanent pass is obviously something that um, you can take to all the races and it covers you for the whole season. I've got obviously had one of these since 92. And um, obviously this is, um, I picked that up on the Tuesday and I went to the track. And then obviously I got those shots of Charles Leclerc going around with his girlfriend on the, on the bike, which was great, a few setup pictures. And then it just progressed from there really. On the Wednesday was a sort of um, setup day, but Wednesday in Australia, as you know, is like a Thursday because they can't walk the track on a Thursday. So. Wednesday becomes a, a sort of a Thursday in Australia and really it was just full-on you know drivers doing track walks uh, just pictures in the paddock and the pits but obviously um, all the cars are covered by screens because they, they're allowed to do that until Thursday so um, and then obviously on Thursday was the press conference uh, driver portraits I did for about three hours which was quite a bit time consuming but then sort of on Thursday you, you got, got an, ins an insight well even Wednesday night but was something going on with the COVID thing and yeah. people were told to keep the distance and all that was going on. Sanitizer started to appear everywhere. And then obviously Thursday night, 
sort of obviously that's when McLaren announced that one guy had got it and that was it really then it was all downhill wasn't it but <laughs> I then went on Friday I, I arrived at the track about seven o'clock in the morning knowing that there was going to be something to report on and it was really more about reporting about you know the the fans really it was more about the fans and there was the press conference obviously but it was the fans doing the thumbs down and yeah, very sort of, sort of thousands feelings, of, yeah there, was, there was thousands at the gate and it was pretty sad and it wasn't just Australians you know there was a lot of you know people from all over the world there you know whether, whether they were from England or, or Europe you know there's a lot of Germans and a real mix of people it's quite interesting to see them and I guess those are the real fans that missed out really but they got some time in Australia I guess and they got to see Melbourne and that was important but obviously as soon as Friday happened we were out of there really because we we were just worried that they were going to close down the airports. That was the main thing. But um, yeah, well, I was I was actually yeah, sitting so, in Perth waiting for the FIA to uh, approve yeah. all of our media passes because they hadn't actually approved the Australian media, uh, the ad hoc guys okay. like myself. Um, yeah, sure, and sure. And they finally approved it on Wednesday, so I started looking yeah, yeah. around for flights to come over, and then I started hearing hearing some whispers that mm. it was going to not happen. Um, sure, so I was yeah, literally yeah. going to book a flight Friday morning, uh, and then I, yeah, yeah. I think I was up at about one o'clock uh, Perth time, and there was a lot of stuff coming out that it just wasn't going to happen. So um, yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, so it was best to stay away. At that point, it was best to stay away, but yeah. um, you just didn't know. I mean, one person caught it; he was then isolated, and literally because of that, McLaren pulled out, and then once they pulled out, the championship. That, that race definitely was over, you know, the championship was still alive, but, um, and that was what FIA said, if, you know, if one, one team pulls out, um, and I, when I came back to England, I actually isolated for seven days to make sure I didn't have any symptoms really. It was more, it was more about that because I didn't want to infect my family because my wife works at the hospital. She could then infect people. And it was, it was just, it was just an easier thing to do. So I stayed in a bedroom for six, I only actually stayed there for six days. I didn't have any symptoms and I've actually had the antibody test, I, I did the antibody test because the Oxford University and the government are sending out test kits for people to see if they've had it. And I, I, I accepted that and did the sort of survey and I haven't, I hadn't got it. Um, thank goodness. Well, maybe it's a good thing if I had it. I, I don't know really. It's difficult to know, isn't it? But um, so yeah, it's, it's all good. It's all positive. Formula one, obviously is back on the road and we've had three races. Yeah. But it's a total dominance by Mercedes at the moment. It, Again, <laughs> it's, I, can't, I can't see them. I can't see any of the team really beating them. To be honest, I, I still think they've got a lot left in the tank. I don't even think they've probably even turned the engine up. To be honest, um, Silverstone will will give us even more of a, a guidance of how much ahead they are. Mm, and to be absolutely. honest, they're probably going to be even further ahead because those those tracks that we had in in Austria and Hungary are quite twisty. I know there is some straights, but they're not real power circuits. You know, not really a lot of power on long straights. And I think obviously Silverstone's got that. And you, you're going to see a probably even bigger gap, possibly. Yeah. I don't know. It depends on the weather. But the weather looks really good. It's going to be, I think, 30 here on Friday, believe it or not. Yeah, nice. It's going to be crazy. Yeah, 29.30 Silverstone, which is going to be the sort of a heat wave coming over yeah. from, looks like it's coming from the Atlantic, actually. Um, but yeah, so it's going to be a bit weird. But it cools down on Saturday and then cools down again on Sunday. And then possible rain Monday, Tuesday. So it's a bit weird weather. But that's England for you. It's it's very unpredictable. Even though we're in the middle of our summer, we never really get a proper summer like we used to, um, you know, sort of 10, 15 years ago. Um, maybe even longer. But um, but we do get odd, odd weather patches coming in. So we may have a dry one for this one and then a wet one for the second one, which I don't mind. You know, I like, you know, we had those wet days in, um, in Austria and we had them in, in Hungary. And actually they do create great races. I think wet races are always quite excitable because you don't know, you know, it's like the Haas team came out with the slicks, you know, they went straight in the pits and put the slicks on knowing that it was going to dry quite quickly. And that was a quite clever move really. And they got a point in the end. They probably should have had two points or three points, but, um, but they got, they got a point on the table and that was for them. I think it was a huge success, but um, McLaren weren't so, so positive in, in Hungary, but uh, they were great in Austria. I think that was probably more a, strategy to be honest i think lando i don't know he just didn't seem to be on it i don't know what was wrong there but yeah. Um, but yeah mercedes are dominating at the moment red bull 
that was an incredible change on the grid there, wasn't it? Whether, whether it was illegal or not, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> the conspiracy theories are out, aren't they? But um, oh, yeah. yeah, so it was all, it was, it was, yeah, I mean, you know, from a from photographer's point of view, we're only allowed to shoot on the outside of the track. So um, in Hungary, we had a few little extra bits we could do, like drivers arriving. You probably saw that I, I shot all the drivers arriving and going through the heat test, yes. which was quite funny. And we weren't allowed to do that in the first two races. We weren't allowed to go anywhere near the paddock, but because the photo room is literally near where they arrive, we were lucky that we could shoot that from, I was actually shooting from a massive distance on the long lens. So um, I was nowhere near them. So I felt I was within the confines. The other photographers, I'm not sure, they were down low and they had to pass the photographers. So I, I was fine. I was up on this sort of set of stairs where the media room is. So the media room there was, un, a photo room was underneath the sort of paddock. And you could walk out onto the track quite easily. And the, we had our own buses. So each agency has their own bus. Right. And literally, you got his <laughs> WhatsApp number and you would call him and go out on the circuit with him. And he, he was basically there at your beck and call, which is great. So he could wait for you on a corner or, you know, like at the first corner I did. For the first corner, he would then take me back to the podium or whatever, wherever you wanted to go. So it was great in that sense. Um, obviously, I did the start which was great, but it was a bit wet. So you had a bit of spray in the background, but anyway, it soon dried. And then there was a lot of overtakes into that first corner, which was great. And then obviously I did the finish and then did the podium. So that was the first podium we've been able to shoot a proper podium as well, because they were actually on the podium tower rather than being on the track. So that was a, a great move forward. So each, it seems like each race is changing and moving in different directions, which is great it's actually getting more positive to be honest because we can do more and that's that's what we want isn't it we don't want to be just going around the circuit we can do a yeah. little bit more i mean i was lucky I, I was in the press conference in in austria in that first on that thursday and did all the drivers but it was three and a half hours working it was a lot it was a long it was like 15 20 minutes each set of drivers and then you got the next one and the next one it went on for three and a half hours but it was great to do that set of pictures, the first person really to shoot the drivers with the mask on in the same position, yeah. you know, in these lovely red chairs with a sort of a nice backdrop, but, um, and, but there were distance. But, but at least I was there to shoot that. It was quite a privilege. I was the only photographer shooting that, you know, you could hear my shutter going off. I said to them, is it all right? You know, do you want me to put it on? Because I can go to a, a sort of um, way, a mode where you lift the shutter up, so there's no. It's a little bit quieter, and they said, "No, don't worry about it. It's, it's part of the press conference, so it's fine." <laughs> so, I, but I could move around. You know, the guy, the, the cameraman said, "Look, just move around, just be quiet." Um, but I could then shoot from sort of three or four different positions around where the drivers were from different angles, which was great, and they didn't mind me doing that. So, as long as I kept away from the drivers, but they all said thank you at the end. It was great. Each driver said thank you to us, not on the cameraman, but the photographer. And, and obviously uh, Tom Clarkson, who was doing the questions. So it was, it was quite nice. It was, you sort of feel like you're important and they're thanking you for that, you know? So that was, that was great. It's a bit like when they do the, the driver's portraits in Melbourne, you know, there's about 30 of us there, 30 or 40 of us doing the same shot, but they do say thanks at the end, which is great, you know? And that once we've done those portraits, we don't really need to do them then for the rest of the year. We've got them all in the same position, similar light and full length, close in and things like that. So it's, it's great to get that set of pictures in the bag, you know, as you could say. And I'm, maybe I'll be doing it again on Thursday. I'm not sure. We're just working out where everyone's going to go on Thursday and what we're going to do. But uh, okay. yeah. Well, let's. Have you got let's any step, questions for me? Let's, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's step I'm Sure, away. you have. Let's step away from Formula One um, and let's, let's talk about you. Um, when did you first catch the motorsport bug? When did you decide motorsport's what you wanted to photo? Well, I guess you have to go back to when pretty much I was a very small boy, really. My father used to take us to the races at Alton Park, which is my local track in Manchester. And my mum just said to my dad, just take the kids out for the day. And we used to go to the local track. Like I said... And that was my bug really from a little boy, but obviously I never really watched the racing. I was just, my dad used to buy me a little, you know, a little corgi toy or whatever. We used to go around in the dirt while my brother was a little bit older and he was sort of beside the track watching with my dad. And then I got, I got photographed with loads of cars really. I mean, cars and drivers and people and got autographs from 
a very early age, but there was a race called the Gold Cup, which is quite famous in Alton Park. And that's where all the Formula One drivers actually came to Alton Park, believe it or not. And they raced there, Formula One, Formula Two. And that was really the biggest race of the year. And that was, that was amazing to see Jim Clark and Mike Hawthorne and, and all, all of Jackie Stewart, all the guys from the 60s and 70s. So during my early career, that was really how I did it, did it later on. And then obviously my brother managed to get a pass to go in front of the barrier. My, my dad was a keen amateur photographer. Uh, so he took pictures all the time, whether it was of us or, or, or the drivers or the cars, but obviously behind the fence. But once my brother got in front of the fence, I, I then helped him process all those films back at our house, which we did in our dark room. Um, and I just, I got a bit of a feel for, for how he took the pictures and how he started his career. And, I, and I was, obviously I joined him in, in 85, but even in 83, as I hit 18, because you can't get past your 18. So, <clears throat> excuse me, even at 18, I, I, I had massive interest because really just helping him, you know, he, he started working with Senna in 81, 82, and then 83, I was lucky enough to be 18 and go to that. My first ever race meeting was at Alton Park. And um, I just happened to be out the back. My brother said, go out the back of the circuit and just do a different start shot than mine. You know, I don't need you at the first corner. So, and then Senna and Brundle crashed and that was re really it. I, but I didn't have a motor drive, so I literally had to shoot the picture, wind the camera on. <laughs> so I got them side by side as Senna dived down the inside and then obviously they landed on top of each other. And Brundle was very lucky. If you look at the picture, he was very lucky that his head didn't get hit by the car. Um, they got out the car and they looked round it. And that, that, that's the shot I got next, really. Um, and they, those were used all over the world because that was the big battle of that year, Senna and Brundle. Yeah in Formula 3 in England, and um, Senna had won like the first 10 races, he was dominant, but then he started making mistakes, and like this crash, and having accidents, and then the battle went down to the last race at Thruxton, so I was there also at Thruxton for the last race, and did the finish shot, and went to the party afterwards with Senna and his family, but I was also lucky enough to be able to go to my first ever Formula 1 event or it was actually a test Senna, Senna tested the the Tolman and my brother said can you go to Silverstone because I was driving so he said can you go to Silverstone and cover Senna's first ever test of a Formula One car and I'd never even I'd never even taken pictures of a Formula One car before so it was a, not only was it like going into the deep end it was it was it was just crazy and obviously Senna, Senna didn't mean much to me at that point I knew he was, he was quick and he was probably going to be in Formula One but it was really just the experience of going to Silverstone. I mean, for my first ever time at Silverstone as well, not even knowing where to go. You know, it, it was sort of that. And I got some, I actually got, when I look back, I actually got some reasonably good shots. You know, I, if you look at the pictures that I took, they're pretty impressive because a Formula One car is going, you know, at least 50 or 60 mile an hour quicker than a Formula Three car. And the ones I took are pretty good. And they were good, a good record of, of that first test of Senna. I then did the McLaren test he did as well for the autosport, uh, sorry, for, the, for winning the Formula 3 championship with Marlborough. And that was a McLaren test. And um, so, yeah, it was, that was my first really start of it. And I, it's a big passion. It's not just the fact I'm doing the photography. It's a huge passion for the sport as well. You know, it just my, my, my favourite driver was, was Emerson Fittipaldi. That was my hero. And my brother already taken Jackie Stewart, so I, I, I had to have the next driver, <laughs> which was Emo. So, and, and, and Emo is such a legend as well, and he still comes to the races. I saw him in Brazil last year, and I've never really spoken to him, but um, because we bought the David Phipps archive, um, who's got a lot of, obviously, Pitapelli and Jackie Stewart pictures, it was amazing to talk to him about the Phipps archive, and he knew David Phipps, so it was, it was great to, to sort of talk to him about that, really. And, um, yeah, I got him to sign a few things for charity that I do. So that was really good. So yeah, from 83, then went to 84. I did my first Grand Prix in 84 at Brands Hatch. And that was a great experience um, just to go to first. I mean, that was obviously Senna's then. Senna was on the podium at that race in the Tolman, uh, which was an amazing experience to, to shoot that with Pross winning. So, um, and then really in 84, I didn't really do a lot, to be honest. I was working at a studio in Manchester so I'd done a course on, in 83 on photography course, nothing to do with photography, uh, motorsport photography, just to do with general, uh, general photography, uh, the host of spotlighting. So it was more about learning about lighting and just, just generally um, understanding how a camera works. Um, 
I actually shot in 84, uh, sorry, 83, I shot the shuttle. Um, I went to Manchester Airport. I'd heard the shuttle was coming in on the back of the 747. And I went to Manchester Airport and shot that. So that was, that was an incredible sequence of pictures of the shuttle coming into land at uh, Heathrow Airport with a shuttle on top of the jumbo, which is now at Houston. It's in Houston at the um, museum there, which I went to see. Um, so that was an incredible experience doing that. But 84, I didn't really do a lot of photography in motorsport. And then eight, end of 84, my brother said, why don't we set up an agency together um, and we'll call it Sutton Photographic. Obviously before that, it was Keith Sutton. I was still living at home, so I still helped him at home in the dark room and everything processing and just saw the pictures he was taking. But um, 85 was when I first started, you know, professionally. And the, the, my first ever race in 85, so I moved to Toaster near Silverstone, down from Manchester, about 140 miles down from Manchester to Toaster. And we had a very small little terraced house, a uh, very small house, a little three bed. And one, one room was the dark room. One room was my, my, my bedroom stroke the office. And then my brother had a bedroom and that was it. That's all we had. I literally had one cabinet of material in there and literally we started from, from zero really and to build Sutton photographic into Sutton motorsport images, then into Sutton images. Yeah, and it, it progressed. And obviously, we, we, you know, we got bigger and bigger as, as the years went on. But my first ever race in 85 was pretty impressive as well. I, I was so excited. I was just really, really keen to get out on the circuit. So I, it was a Formula 3 race again, believe it or not. And it was at Silverstone. I think it was in March. Of that. It's the first race of the season. There was this new car called the Saab Reynard, which was the Saab engine in the Reynard car, which was the best car. It was really a battle between Rolt and Reynard in, in those years. And um, there was a guy called Anthony Reed. He was quite famous and he became famous again later in touring cars. Uh, but he'd gone out for the first few laps and I went out and practice and it was pouring down with rain, but I was so excited. I just wanted to go out and just take some pictures. I don't know why it was just pouring down. And um, he, he went up the back of a car and barrel rolled in front of me. And I was the only photographer there to shoot. I just kept my finger on the button. I don't, I don't know whether they even refocused. I can't remember. There was no autofocus in those days. Everything was manual. It was a total manual. It was black and white as well. There was no colour. We couldn't afford colour. It was all black and white. And I shot that. He, he landed upside down, got out of the car, and, and then he was okay. And then I thought, I've got to go back and process. So I went straight back to the office, uh, processed it in the tank with the chemicals, and then looked at the film. And wow, it was an amazing sequence. And printed them all. And then the next day was race day, this was practice, and um, took them to the circuit and then handed them out to all the media. And um, I was lucky enough for them to be published in the Daily Express newspaper on the Monday. Um, even though that, that wasn't really the race story, it was still so spectacular sequence that they decided to, um, to publish it. So they used five pictures in the Daily Express newspaper on the Monday. And that was, again, it was published all over the world because it was such a spectacular crash and the beginning of the season, you know, people were, were hungry for, 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 for news as well as pictures, you know, and stories. So it was great to get all that published, really. And that's how our, uh, you can see the passion because, you know, why would you be out there in, in practice in the pouring <laughs> rain? You know, you're completely mad and, and nothing probably would have happened. But I happen to be there in the right place. And that's what, you know, that's what our job's all about, being in the right place at the right time with the right lens, the right exposure, whatever, you know, it's, it, it's a mix of things, but it's also having an insight and a bit of an inkling that something might happen. I yep. think that's the way it works. You're, um, you've done over 500 F1 races. Um, that's right, yeah. How do you deal with the tra you know, all that traveling and maintaining, you know, a, a life outside of the track? Um, well, it's, it's a long story. Obviously you sort of get used to it. I know, I know it's a bit blase that you're traveling around the world, but it becomes a sort of, I guess it just becomes like a normal job. I know it sounds stupid. I know it sounds obviously traveling. I don't mind it. I mean, obviously Australia, obviously where you're from, it, it's a 20 hours of, of flying. And that's, that's, that is probably the hardest flight of the year. We sort of do a, either a, a six or seven hour to Dubai and then another 13, 14 to Australia, or you can split it. I mean, if you were going on holiday, you wouldn't do that in one stint. You'd probably just split it and have a few days in Dubai or Singapore or somewhere else and then, and then go on 
your next trip. But obviously when you're working, obviously you want to be there as soon as you can. And we generally leave on the Saturday or the Sunday and get there Monday. Um, and then obviously, like I said before, I'm, I'm arriving on Tuesday and I'm straight into the job on Tuesday in Melbourne. So it's, it's tough and you have to get straight on the time zone. That's the key thing is, is getting on the time zone of that country. And without that, you, you're really going to struggle. Otherwise, I think mentally you need to get on the time zone. You just need to be, I mean, you're excited. Generally when you go to the first race, anyway, you're excited for that first race. It's, it's a buzz to be there in Melbourne. And, um, and as the season progresses, you then obviously we would have gone to Bahrain after that. And then we would have gone to China and it, it's, it's sort of just flows really. Um, I, I'm, like I said, I'm probably being a bit blase um, in terms of my family life, my kids. Yeah. I mean, I've got two kids. They were born. Well, luckily I was there for the first birth, but the second birth, I missed it. I actually was in Australia. <laughs> he was born on the 6th of March and I missed it. Um, he was born on the Friday of the Grand Prix. So I got a, a call in the morning or late in the evening for me. It was, it was sort of a morning in England saying that I got a son, which was a big surprise. Cause, um, yeah. So, um, I sort of met him five days later um, when I got back to England on the Tuesday. Uh, so that was a bit of a shock to be honest. And he was two, two weeks early, but, um, he, he actually got involved in motorsport as well. He, he, he's a big keen amateur photographer, but, and he's been doing my social, he's been doing social media for the last two or three years. So, it's been nice for him to be involved. He was a swimmer, so I was doing swimming pictures um, just to keep myself occupied. And it was nice to shoot him away from Formula One, really, because the, these are the, the, the pictures you see on the wall. I'm going to get the right side. The pictures you see on the wall there are my only pictures in my house um, that are actually on the wall of, of motorsport, which is a bit weird, but they're in my office. I've got, a, I've got loads here ready to sort of cover my walls. Um, I need to get on it and, uh, and decorate my office. But um, yeah, so it's it's just a, I mean, it, it's a pleasure to go to races, really. I, I, I love, it's not a burden to go on flights. I, I, I suppose, I, like I said before, I'm a bit blasé and I've, I've become used to it, I guess. Um, and I got a bit, I got I got withdrawal symptoms <laughs> during the lockdown period <laughs> that I wasn't travelling. I was sat at home. I wasn't doing nothing. I, I was busy with my garden and my house. I had to keep busy. Because when you when you when you're working away all the time, you're busy every day. You know, I'm doing like ten to fifteen thousand steps a day walking, which I try and do, and that keeps me healthy. Try and keep myself fit, really, um, because it, you know, we we go out for dinner. The, 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 the thing about this life as well is that you're going out for dinner every night. You, you, you know, you generally you're having a drink every night as well to relax. Um, so it's it's not a very good life in terms of your health <laughs> on, on a general basis. But, um, uh, but but in terms of you know of, of my life, I just I still love what I do. You know, I'm 55, but I've done over 500 races, 523, I think it is. But um, I still I still have a massive passion for what I do, and I love I love I can't wait to get to Silverstone, you know, and take pictures really, whether it's the drivers or or cars on the circuit. Yeah. So yeah, that's pretty much you, it. You really. sort of answered my next question was you know about maintaining your healthy lifestyle. I mean, I see you know every now and then come up on Instagram, yeah. you know, you. Uh, fruit and oats and stuff in the morning and yeah. seems to be like it's not that like that every day. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest i started doing i started doing the food thing just to wind people up to be honest um, <laughs> i mean is rhubarb yeah. the secret i'm the rhubarb yeah <laughs> i'm a tiktok that was, that was a weird one because my, my daughter saw somebody somebody do that with a cucumber and i didn't have a cucumber in my in my in my fridge so the only thing we had was rhubarb. I thought that's perfect. We'll do it with the rhubarb, and it actually went massive. It's it, it's got like three million views or something. I've not I've not done one since, to be honest, because I I didn't know what to do to make myself look stupid anymore. <laughs> anyway, well, I think it's just the the timing and and rhubarb it was the time, sort of yeah yeah. yeah. It, it it just worked with the rhubarb, to be honest. And if, if you've not seen it, it's quite funny on my TikTok, but um, uh, and I did put it on my my Instagram, but um. It, you had to keep during that lockdown period we just had to keep occupied and keep keep laughing really i mean yeah. i mean really i mean there's people still in lockdown you know i mean mm. you know we've got lockdown still happening in in england you know obviously leicester's had a massive lockdown again it looks like now they've, they've, they've banned all the brits from going to uh, spain all those millions i think there's like hundreds of thousands in spain at the moment they have to quarantine when they get back but obviously they didn't know that when they went there and um 
it, it's it's not nice but um yeah you just got to keep occupied i mean the whole the whole job really is is it is about trying to keep fit and healthy but it's very difficult in this in this job to do that i've, I've probably put on a few stone over the years but you can see it in my face but in the lockdown period i actually lost a stone in weight because i was working on my garden and i was occupied every day doing something and try to do these walks I, I don't really run i'm not a runner and i've actually got i've actually got gym equipment here in my I'm probably just uh, if i move it around there i've got i've got a gym there look. <laughs> i've never really used it that was bought not for me it was for my son because he was he was doing the swimming and he was getting to a point where he would have to start to build these muscles so 15 16 you can then start to work on a muscle strength you know so it was really for him it's not it's not for me i'm, go, I'm just giving excuses on her but i do have a cross trainer and um, a cycle machine in, in my um, in my dining room and um but it's 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 a we do walk a lot that's the thing and the, and the mind is always working that's the other thing you know so in terms of of keeping yourself occupied it, it, it's a mind thing you know knowing what to do next and the process of how it all works each day um, and deciding where to go on the track that's another that's another key part of it i mean we, we in most these first three races we were a team of four photographers on the circuit um shooting only from the track so we all wanted to go to the best positions you know on, on in hungary on that thursday i'm sorry on the friday i went to do that shot with the water tower and that's a quite a famous picture and i did post an old photo from 92 that i had with senna i think it was senna and um a lazy to show us similarities that it's not actually changed the position over the years. It's exactly the same as it was in 92. I think the barrier's lower. I think there's only two layers of barrier and it was much easier to shoot. But in terms of, and obviously there's less photographers. I posted a picture yesterday of all the photographers lined up. I was right at the front and there's like 10, 15 right, photographers. Position. <laughs> obviously in, yeah, in Hungary, there was only four of us. Uh, but that's just the way it is, you know, I and mean, there's so many good places to shoot in Hungary. But you decide over the day and each day what you're going to do before you do it. Uh, that's the way we work. And I, I, bagged, I bagged that one straight away, knowing that that picture would be used by all the teams, to be honest, because it's a good shot. It's just typical hungry. It's got the village in the background. It's, it's quite a clean picture. You've, not, you've got a couple of markers that say it's Pirelli, but that doesn't really matter because Pirelli's, Pirelli's sort of an independent sponsor and the teams don't mind posting Pirelli. It's not, yep. not like it's one Pacific, you know, it's not Rolex or it's not Emirates or it's not Aramco or the other, you know, the sponsors that are in Formula One. It's quite an independent brand. So, uh, but yeah, um, I managed to bag that one, which was great. And I, 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 they wanted me at the first corner. I, I don't always, you know, because there's four of us, we don't always want to do the first corner, but there can be a crash. So you, it's nice to be at the first corner just in case you know but i'm not that bothered you know it, it just the way the, the process works i did the first corner then went up the straight and did the finish shot My, mine was the rear sort of rear three quarter finish like i did in austria very similar but and then we had one guy doing the head on so and then we both went onto the track and did them with the podium so that's the way the process worked i did actually i mean just to give you an example i did try and shoot the park Ferme. After, so I, I basically, when, when the car started to come back, I, I was able to jump over the, 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 the fence and go up to the wall and shoot with the gap. And I got a great position to shoot the Park Fermi and then two marshals just stood in front of me. So you, you just don't know with the fire extinguishers that were literally in my shot, so that it was ruined. So I just gave up. And that, but that's the way it is. But then one guy got... <laughs> I've got the photo if you want to see it. It's, it's not a very really nice picture, but it just <laughs> proved that I was ready for the shot. It just didn't happen. And that's, that's sometimes what happens. You know, same with the podium, really, sometimes. You, you can be blocked by somebody. You can, the, you know, the guys presenting the trophy can be in front of the shot. I mean, a lot of the jump shots, when you had Michael doing the jump, I'm about to post one of, of Mark Webber, actually, when he won the British Grand Prix in 2012. And in that photo, the guy who presented the trophies in the shot, he came on the podium and jumped in the air. You've probably seen it. It's quite a famous shot where he's jumped and he's lifted his legs up. It's not, not Michael Schumacher-esque. It's more of a, a, silly, a silly jump. I don't know what he did it for, but it, be, it became Mark Webber's sort of symbol, symbol jump, I guess. And he did that a couple of times. But um, the guy's in the way, and it's not a clean picture. I hate unclean pictures, and that's sometimes... That frustrates photographers when you haven't got a clean picture. It really does. Um, we're always looking, like with that, the shot with the, you know, the water tower. 
you're always looking for a clean photo, tight in the frame, clean picture. <clears throat> and you don't want people in it as well. And you don't want toilets in it. And, you know, there's various things. <laughs> there was like another shot I was doing. I, I, was, I was on the inside of sort of turn. I'm not sure what corner it was. It's like two turns before the ending. I went on the inside. And there's a really nice shot as they come in with the cockpit. You can do that shot. But you can also do a wide shot through the barrier. And I did a couple of those for the barrier. But then in the background, there's two vans. There was two vans parked there. I don't know even know why they were there. Normally, they have it really clean and there was a toilet there. And you just don't want to get those in your, in, your, in your pictures. It just looks awful having a toilet in your frame. You know? So uh, one thing I would say to people is always try and look for a clean angle, clean picture. No, not so many, no sponsor board. You know, just make it as clean as possible. And if you have to blur the picture by dropping the shutter speed, that's great. But most times you just want to look for a clean angle. Um, no toilets, no cranes, no, no ambulances, no, no marshals. All those things you don't want really in your photo if you can help it. And you just maybe need to move five yards further down or go further forward. Um, but that's one thing I would say to people is that pe certainly, you know, magazines and sponsors are always looking, teams are always looking for clean photos. That's what they will use. You know. One little tip for people. Now, Next um, question. <laughs> the... Um... Yeah, it's funny actually. Uh, I had a bit of a catch up with Manuel Goria um, a couple of oh, years yeah, ago. Oh yeah, yeah, Manuel. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And um, yeah, yeah. He was very adamant about uh, advertising boards, uh -huh. and you know, if you have to have the advertising board in, make sure it's the whole advertising rather than chopping it. So it's interesting right. to hear the, the similarities between you two on that topic. Well, I mean, it's. I mean, if you if you look at the the start I did, I mean, I was working. We work for Aramco, so. I mean, we were just shooting a ramp off that start line, you know, I mean, obviously over the brow and then as they come towards you, it's, they wanted a full sequence with all the cars, but you did have a little bit of spray within the picture. I mean, it's not the perfect photo because you want it sunny. You want it, per it, it was perfect light when the sun was out, but for that start, it wasn't really the perfect shot, but they'll still use it. I'm sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously then when, when you look around the corner, the cars were coming in overtaking it's pot look you could sort of pick from a sequence so there what you would do is shoot, obviously shoot a sequence around the corner and hope that you got the ramco in but most of the shots that they can use for formula one in advertising have to have three three cars in it and three people so it is restricted so two cars wouldn't work anyway but you shoot it for the sake of shooting it really and just to show them that you can get two two cars within one frame yeah. but yeah most most i agree with manuel in, in the fact that you want to you know you don't want Pirel, yeah. you want Pirelli, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, yeah. it just, no one will ever use it. Um, I mean, if you look at the shot I did of, um, of Bottas, when Bottas was there in the wet coming into the corner, you'll see F1 had the slow motion version of my picture. When Bottas came in, he was completely on full opposite lock. And then because he's finished, he can drive in the wet, he drives in the snow, he's got incredible car control. And then he was able to flick it back. But on the slow-mo, you can see that full sequence. But on my frame, I've used it, but I've picked the one with Pirelli. And it, it sort of keeps everyone happy by doing that. Not only Mercedes, I know Mercedes used it, but also Pirelli obviously used it. Um, but if you've only got Pirel, <laughs> it ain't going to work. You know, <laughs> It just doesn't look right at the end of the day. Um, otherwise, you would shoot without the boards. You know, That's the key thing. It's either with or without in, in most cases. Now, you've been around for various eras of Formula One. Uh, Senna versus Prost, yeah. Schumacher, yeah. Uh, the Red yeah. Bull Vettel dominance, and now Mercedes Hamilton yeah. dominance. Do you That's have right. a favourite era, either out of that lot or perhaps outside of that lot, that you would say would have been your favourite to be involved with? I, I think, personally, I think the early part of my career was, was, was the key part because, obviously... I was doing Formula One. I did about three or four races a year in those early years. So I was learning my trade from, from eight. We started, you know, we, we talked about it before. I started in 85. But then I was doing Formula Four, Formula Three. In fact, I found my schedule the other day when I was looking for my memorabilia. It was 36 races in that one year, which is bonkers, really. But 
in order to learn, you know, you can't go and learn motorsport photography in college, but you can learn, what I did was learn the basics. And then you pick up on that and decide which, which way you want to go. So as I say to many people is that you try and try and shoot as much as you can, whether it's karting, whether it's motocross, whether it's even football or cricket or whatever you want to do, just shoot something every day. Even if it's the cars going past, they'll probably think you're a speed camera, but um, just be careful. But um and obviously don't shoot kids unless you've got permission, things like that. So there's certain restrictions, but just try and shoot stuff all day, you know, try and shoot something every day and you'll get better and better and better at your job. And the, the way I learned was that I was doing national motorsport really. And I, 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 I was lucky enough to do Le Mans for eight years from 83, uh, sorry, nine, 85 to 93. But I did find out the other day I did 95, so I actually went on longer. <laughs> I didn't realise I was there in 95, but anyway, uh, when McLaren won, but I was there. Um, and I also did quite a lot of Formula 3000, so I started to do international Formula 3000, which was, some of those races were away from Formula 1, which was great. So I did things like Poe, I did Enna, and they were stand-alone stand, stand alone events. But obviously... I then did the Grand Prix event. So Hockenheim was one and Spa was another and I do the British. So I pretty much did three or four races in those early years. And then obviously 19, uh, 1992 was my big break. We, we got a contract with a magazine in Japan called F1 Week. And that meant I had to provide all the films. I've actually still got a roll of film here. And it was, it was these sort of films that we had to provide. This is a roll of Velvia, which many people might know, but this was the 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 most best film or the, the, the greatest film at the time. So there was Velvia, but there was also um, a thing called Sensia. Uh, so you had these two rolls of film to choose from. So Velvia was the, the 50 ISO, very low ISO, more used for when you were in the sunlight, but you push that one stop to 100. And then you had Sensia, which you could push two stops. So that would go to 400. And that was pretty much it. They then produced a film that was 1600 ISO, but it was quite grainy. So it didn't really go down that route. I think we used it at one race, but it was just too grainy. So those were the two films at that point. But what it, what it meant was that we had to give those rolls of film to this magazine. So I shot one roll or one camera for, for, um, for Sutton Images and then one for, G, for this F1 week in Japan. Those films then went back from qualifying back to Japan. They made a selection, laid out the magazine, and then the race films would go back straight away after the race by a courier straight to the airport straight on the flight he laid the magazine then came out on the wednesday in japan which was revolutionary i mean normally it would be either two weeks wait later or a month you know so this was revolutionary at that point but it was a magazine that came out with technical pictures it was portraits of the drivers from those practice shots and the qualifying and then they slipped in like three or four pages of the race, mainly my shots, but also there was a Japanese photographer. So that's when I started doing all the Grand Prix in 92. So for me, that era, when I first started, I was lucky enough, obviously, to see Senna in that 92, 93 and, and 94 season and the Mansell battle, the, the Schumacher battle. And I, I felt really at that time as well, it was more relaxed, but it was at the period where it was the biggest. I mean, to me, that was the biggest period at that real point. It really was. There was no social media at that point. So to, to be that big at that point was incredible. To have those amazing world champions and those icons of Formula One, you know, Senna, Mansell, Schumacher, Prost at that particular time, and PK really as well, you've got to point him in there, um, was, was just incredible um, period. Really. Those four drivers were just battling for every race. Obviously, Senna, uh, I was amazed to see Senna come through his career now. I didn't do many races with him in those early career in those early races, but then to watch him in every race in '92 was amazing. Obviously, '92 was Mansell's year, yeah. so what, to see Nigel win his world championship was was just incredible. To be there, obviously in Hungary, uh, was an incredible experience. But also to go into '93 and then take that picture with the flying fin, which I've got a copy of here. Um, <clears throat> To make that photo in 93, only my second year in Formula One was pretty special um, in Adelaide. Um, and this is the actual print. I showed it the other day, I think, um, to people. I couldn't find it. I didn't know where it was. <laughs> and uh, it was hidden in my wardrobe, believe it or not. Uh, but this is the original print that was printed by the, this was printed by the lab. So when I took the photo, the film got processed overnight. Um, 
and then we didn't know I didn't really know where I got it and then there was a big scream and everyone went to the table the picture was just incredible this is 1 25th of a second which is bonkers you can see the blur in the background if you look the blur yeah. on the fence I was actually doing a pan picture of the curb of this curb against the fence and if you look in auto course of this year on the same double page is a pan shot and then this shot so it proves what I was doing and then we got 50, 50 dupl duplicates made of the original and then we also got three prints made on that day uh, I gave one so I went to see Mika and showed him the print and he went completely ballistic. So did the team, they didn't know what was going on. They never saw it on TV. I then got Mika to sign it. And as you can see, he signed it the Flying Finn and that became his name. Um, and as you can see, this is 93. So this is when he signed it. Literally after I showed it him, he, I then gave him one of those. This was in his office on his wall at the uh, Keki Rosberg's. He was Keki, managed by Keki Rosberg. That was in the Keki Rosberg office. And also the lab had one. So I gave one to the lab because they did it so quick. And I found it the other day. So it's, it's amazing to have the original print. And on the wall, this is um, a real good memory for me. And it still sells. This is the most sold picture probably in our archive. Um, and as you know, um, I know you're going to talk about it in a minute, but we got, we got Sutton Motorsport Images now is owned by Motorsport Network. So that's um, in their archive now and, and, and able to, you can buy that. Um, but last about three, uh, two years ago, I did a, I did a, a memory, uh, a sort of a, a historic 25 years with Mika. It was great to meet him in again and have a real long chat with him, to be honest, because never really talked about it with him. And when you're in motor, when you're in, in Formula One, you don't really get to speak to the drivers on a one-to-one -one basis, or you, you would say hello and have a little chat, but they don't really have the time. So it was great to speak to Mika in Japan and really just go through what happened and. I videoed quite a lot of it um, for my own purposes, really. And um, I never knew that actually he broke his front, when he landed, he broke his front wing and went back to the, the, the team were more concerned about the front wing damage than actually what he did to the car when he was in the air. So that was, that was a quite a good insight, but you don't know these things until you speak to the drivers later. And that, that, was, that was a great insight from Mika. And we were having a couple of beers together in, in this bar in the hotel in Japan. In Suzuka and it was it was great and he was signing away and it was you know Mika Mika knows that, that that's one of his most famous pictures and why he's called the flying fin you know so it's it's yeah. so for me to that, that for me that period of 92 into 94 and then I guess the Michael dominance from 94 95 was quite an important year but also you know I mean each era is, is pretty special I guess like you said before the Vettel era was was amazing to see him come into to Red Bull and just dominate for those four years um, and we sponsored Sebastian so we were quite good friends you know in terms of I did have quite a few chats with him when he was in former BMW and we talked about you know what, what, what's your next step and where you're going to go and you know his career was amazing you know and, and even Lewis you know Lewis obviously I did, we didn't sponsor Lewis but I remember photographing him even at the Autosport show he used to do the karting event there as a little boy you know I could see he was pretty special then, to be honest. Um, you know, he stood out and he, he actually was carting with one of my photographers, <laughs> which was pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty special. So that was, that was quite funny, yeah. You know, and then obviously see his career come through from the karting stage, because we sponsored Tonio Luzzi. He was the, um, he was world karting champion in 2011. And um, Lewis was there with, with Nico and Michael, Michael Schumacher. And obviously Lewis wasn't really that, that quick at that point but obviously got better and better as he came through his karting career and dominated in single seater you know Formula three and form form of uh G, gp2 where it's called then but um and obviously to see him go into into mclaren was amazing and obviously dominate even in that first year you know so it's it's been interesting career you know all the way through really mm. it's it's gone really quick where, where, where's 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 all the years gone you know if you think about it from 85 85 to now it's gone like it's gone like that really to be honest yeah. um but even doing those years in Le Mans I really enjoyed those years doing Le Mans and doing something not that there wasn't Formula One and we worked for Jaguar um during those success years which was amazing having access to go pretty much where we wanted and um just to get the atmosphere of Le Mans was was amazing and obviously to shoot in those old pits. I remember I did, 
I was actually on the pit wall, sorry, on the ledge of the, of the pit, the old pit. You could actually shoot above and shoot into the pit stops, which was pretty special. You had to get out through the hospitality window, but, <laughs> uh, but you can't do that now. So you think about those old tracks and, uh, you know, you think about the old circuits that we don't go to anymore. Uh, places like Korea, um, Turkey, uh, India, uh, Magni Kaur was, was one. Obviously, we're going to go back to Imola, which is going to be amazing yeah. later this year. I mean, it's going to be amazing to go back to Imola. I have actually been back there a couple of times. I, I went for a Formula 2 race there um, about eight years, nine years ago. But I also went for the Senna celebrations um, about four years ago, five years ago. And that was really nice. Senna and Roland, Roland celebrations with the families and... Yep. Obviously, Ferrari were there, and it, that, that was pretty emotional, to be honest. But I, I did actually do a track walk, go around the circuit, and go and look at the old corners, and it's not changed at all. It's still the same circuit. They've obviously tried to rebuild the pits there, which is going to be interesting, but they never built the top of them. They just built the pit garages and didn't build the top, which was a bit weird. I think they ran out of money. But, um, yeah, it's going to be amazing to go back, and obviously we're going to go to Porto Mao. We're going to go back to the Nürburgring, which is going to be really nice. I've posted some stuff from... I think it's the 2007 race, the crazy race in the rain at the first corner, which was just bonkers. That, that was one of the craziest races because you literally just stood there. I, I think I, I, I mentioned that Ercole Colombo helped us out with his, um, he had this big Ferrari umbrella, which saved us because without that, I think the cameras would have been wrecked, but he put this umbrella up and <laughs> about six guys got saved from the rain. And then literally we just stood there and, and everything was happening in front of us. All you had to do really was, was focus on what was happening. You know, people were just going off left, right and centre. It was like, it was a monsoon rain coming down a hill and literally you couldn't grip and literally just went into the gravel trap one after another. It was like, yeah. you've seen it sometimes on YouTube where people have been going off in the snow, haven't you? Where they've been spinning and like yeah. in Russia <laughs> or some of the Scandinavian countries and they just can't do anything. It was like that. It was really... It was bizarre, but I love the Nürburgring. It's, it's, it's a beautiful part. It's going to be interesting time of the year. <laughs> it's like, it's going to be really cold. And I remember being there for one session in the 90s and um, they delayed it because of fog. And I think that could be an issue again because we're in literally in the Ardennes mountains. I think it's the Ardennes. I think it's the Ardennes. I can't remember. Anyway, but we're in the mountains and it's literally, you're never sure what's going to happen each day. It's, it's a bit like in maybe it's Spa's Ardennes. I don't, anyway, I'm mixed up between the two. But Spa's the same. I know Spa's in late August, but you're never sure in Spa. It's right in the, in the, in the, you know, in the forests and literally in the mountains. You, it can just come in. The fog can literally just come in. And it's going to be cold. It's going to be cold. It could be easily be rain, you know. So we, we could have the same sort of thing, really. It's going to be interesting. But my era, I think, really, like it's going back, is, is, is the 90s for me. Mm. Early 90s going into... I can't even remember anymore, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I, I've got a very bad memory. I've uh, probably got dementia like my dad, but anyway. Uh, but I, I, I certainly remember those early times with Senna, Mansell and Prost. And, yep. you know, it was, it was an incredible era. I remember Senna, I clearly remember Senna at the, um, when he won the Adelaide Grand Prix in 93. I got my shot of him with the two arms out of the car coming down the pit lane. But then I went to the press conference that day and it was an amazing press conference. You know, people asking him, you know uh, amazing questions and he was he always thinking about what he was going to say before he said it it was amazing to listen to him just just to hear his replies were amazing and it's it's great when they when they show them back on formula1.com you know where, mm. when they show those interviews because they're, they're, they're so incredible um the thought that's in there you know it's it's amazing okay Sorry. i've gone on too much no no <laughs> We're going to look, this, this is um, great here. Like sometimes we have guests on and we've got to keep prompting them and prompting them and prompting them. And other times like yourself, you know, just keep chatting, which is great. Um, yeah, but I'm going exactly. to pick your brain a bit. The, obviously, okay. you know, many, it's what, 40 years, around 40 years in motorsport photography. Um, <laughs> roughly. 35. 35. <laughs> Sorry, I won't, won't add extra years on. It's all right, mate. It's all right. <laughs> 35 is a pro. We'll say 35 is a pro. 35. I did a couple a of years as, as work experience. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a standout, and I will ask the opposite of this, but a standout good oh. moment, like one standout good moment of your career? 
Moment or photograph? Moment or photograph. I've got a few. <laughs> Could you pick one? It's a bit one? difficult to pick them. I mean, I mean, I'm obviously the flying fin. I guess it really, what, what it did was, you know, I mean, that's, if you think about it, that's sort of my ninth year doing pictures and no one probably knew who I was. But then as soon as, as soon as I took that photo and it's published everywhere, I became, I wouldn't say famous, but I became re a renowned photographer. I became an experienced photographer. I sort of earned my stripes, as you could say, on my, on my you know, on my, on, on my shoulder there. I guess that's what happened when, when you create a picture, when you look at each photographer's career, they create a particular moment and they become iconic moments. And I guess the flying fin is one of those moments, you know, and there's been many more ever since, you know, otherwise why would I be doing it or why, 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 why should you be doing it? You need to create those moments every year. And I guess I mean, I've, I've, I've got some pictures that I've, I know I've done for other, uh, I guess if you look back for the last three years, you know, the, the one that sticks in my mind is, is this one of, of the Lewis, the Lewis golden moment. Yeah, such a beautiful and this shot. one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's such an incredible photo, but it's, it's such a magical moment because you've got to look, I think as a photographer, you're looking for a particular moment to happen and you've gone on a punt or you've, you, you've done something, you've gone to a particular corner or you, you've got some knowledge. You know, if you think about Darren Heath's picture of the pedals, this, this was a moment where I, I didn't know I was going to get this. Totally, totally never knew I was going to get this picture. I just thought sometimes you're looking for a different angle. You're looking for a different way to shoot the podium. And I happened to sh be able to go on top of that hospitality building or the, the, the uh, control tower building in Montreal, which has now been destroyed, actually, so you can't do it anymore, um, and then shoot the podium from above with about three other, four other photographers. So it was not just me there. There was a lot, a few others. And obviously, I just kept shooting, as I always do. You know, I don't stop shooting. And at that particular moment, he went off to leave the podium. And as you can see, the sunlight hit the trophy for one frame only. Yeah. And I did show it. I've showed it on my Instagram and I've shown it on many other things that it's only one frame. So the sequence as he's leaving, he's wow. literally walked, he's walked into the light, you know, and it's pretty special. And I didn't know I'd taken it, literally then went back through the frames and went, oh, that's quite different, quite nice. And didn't think really thinking of it. And then I'd sent those pictures back to England, um, obviously, because we transmit everything now. And then obviously formula1.com used it as their picture and then Lewis used it. And then I went to Toronto. I had a friend in Toronto. I found out Lewis had gone to Toronto. So I thought, I've got to do something with this amazing picture. He's used it as well. So he, he knows that it's a great picture. So I thought, let me try and get in touch with him. So I've, I knew his, his sort of guru, uh, Spins Beats, who works with him on various projects. And um, I got in touch with Spins and we, we hooked up and said, could, could we do a charity project? And I think it would be great for Lewis to, you know, to be seen to be doing charity stuff. And, and then he said, yeah, yeah, bring, bring them along. So I got 10 printed and we took them along and got them signed. And then, you know, I was able to then give something back as well to the sport, not only to sport, but obviously to charities around the world. And that was great. And then after that, <laughs> I then will show you the next one. Um, so then I started something off, really. I thought I'm going to have to do something every year because <laughs> I'd started with one. And then I thought, um, so you're probably going to like the next one because it, it, it's it's it's. Um, it's your local guy. Well, he's, oh, he's from no, Perth as well. Photo, and I love this photo. So this is the belly flop photo. Yep, so it, the belly flop. again, I mean, it, I guess it's an iconic shot, but we didn't know. I mean, I only found out this year that I didn't even know this, but because somebody posted the video to me, I only found out that they were talking in the press conference. I didn't know this. I really didn't. I, honestly, I did not know it. But Lewis said to, said to Daniel, um, you should do a belly flop. Uh, and Daniel looked at him and went, yeah, you're probably right. And I didn't know this because I was, I was already waiting at the energy station for the photo of what it was going to be. Who knows? But they posed up and did the team picture, obviously with all the guys behind, you know, all the guys were lined up there. So we did the team picture with a backdrop. And then we knew Daniel was going to go in the pool, but we didn't know what he was going to do. <laughs> and then literally just saw him at the edge and he went like that, belly flop. And then didn't think anything of it. And obviously got the prints done, went to Germany, I think it was that year. 
And then um, ask Daniel, would you mind, you know, signing my pictures? It's been my biggest Instagram post and it was a great moment and all this. And he said, yeah, yeah, whatever you want that. And I said, well, would you sign one to me? And I didn't know what he was going to sign. I really didn't. And he just put belly flop on it. So that for me was quite <laughs> magical. Um, and I, I actually, I've actually tagged it belly flop on most of my stuff. And then really I didn't. And then I got into last year and I didn't really know what I was going to do. I, I had no idea. I'd taken some nice photos and you don't really know um, from year to year what's going to be your best shot. You sort of go from race to race. And I think since we've, since we've actually Sutton's has been is now part of Motorsport Network. Actually, I'm a bit more flexible in what I can do. Um, in 18, I was actually working with the Sauber team, so I was quite restricted in what I could do because when you're working with a team, you're working really in the garage, you're working with the drivers, and then you have your other photographers working on track, and they put into the pool. So I didn't really go much on circuit in eight, in, in 18, and then in 19 last year, I, I was able to go more on track really, and that's great because it almost like reinvents me. I don't really, I didn't really do a lot of action pictures except for in the race in those early, you know, in those probably in like the last 10 years, you know, and it felt, it felt like I was a lot missing something. So it was great last year just to go out on the circuit. And um, I was out there for qualifying. And as you know, um, I love spark pictures and I could see, I was down the first corner and I knew that some of the cars were sparking down there. And then I saw Max go out on his first run and I missed it. And I, oh, so, I was so peeved off. And I thought, right, I'm going to wait for his last run or, or his qualifying run and then just head up there and do qualifying from the outside of the track because they used to stop on the circuit and then do all the celebrations. So I knew I could get there in time. So I thought, I'll wait for his qualifying lap. And literally, they do a warm lap and then they would come down and then they would oh, bottom out on the first corner. And then that was the shot. So that was the shot of the spark, as you can see. It's pretty yeah. spectacular. It's 20th of a second, which is a really slow, mm. really slow shutter speed. And um, it's just, it's actually more in that than, the, than the, they've cropped it slightly in the print. And then I thought, oh, I'll see what it's like. So I, I put that on the back. It was amazing. I thought that is the best one of the sequence. I, I had about three, three frames in the sequence. Sent that back, it got used everywhere. The amazing thing was, and I saw Sean Bratchett, I, I, I was working with F1 Experiences last year, and Sean Bratchett came to the hospitality, and I showed him the picture, and he went, wow, that's the best, one of the best shots I've ever seen. He said, look, he said, is that on F1.com? I said, I don't think it is. He said, well, can you send it to me, and I'll send it to them. <laughs> so he ended up dealing with this guy, with Sean, and then he sent it to Formula One. I don't think they even used it. I don't know why. They should have done, but anyway, that didn't matter. So then, for the race, now for the race, Again, we're working with a team of people. You don't know really where you're going to go. If it's not the first corner, if it's the last corner, whatever, you know, you, you just look for your position and you utilize it, whatever you can. They said, would you mind going to shoot turn three? Still do the grid, walk all the way through and do, because it's about five or 10 minute walk, you should be fine. So I said, yeah, I'll do the grid. So I was on the grid in, in 19. You can do all the grid pictures, you can do whatever the drivers, drivers lined up and everything. And then I walked down to, to turn three, which Turn two, I think it's probably more turn two than three, but anyway. Um, and it's a Pirelli picture, so we work for Pirelli, so it's just a boring shot with the Pirelli start, really. And, and really, nothing happened during the whole race. <laughs> nothing happened at all, but it was probably the best race of the whole year, but I was just <laughs> in the wrong place. But So I was getting more and more frustrated. I did the exit of, 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 of three or two, whatever it is and got nothing there either, and then went into the complex or the, the stadium bit with the, with the Mercedes grandstand, nothing there really. And, and then got back and I had the pit wall tab on, so it meant I could go on the pit wall and I missed the pit stops, but it meant I could go and do the flag. So I went and did the flag and I thought, this is gonna be okay picture of Max coming across the line because Max obviously won the race. I've already got the Max picture here. And I didn't know what was gonna happen and I thought, I'll just keep my finger on the button. So I got the picture of him with the flag. I've got to find it. I've got a picture of him with the flag. And then um, the main thing was then to get the picture, just keep your finger on the button, really. And I always say to people, a bit like with the Lewis shot, always keep your finger on the trigger. It doesn't cost you anything. When it was the film days, you know, that, that only had 36 frames. You know, it's got it here for you, just to remind you, 36 frames, that's all you're going to get. You might squeeze it to 37 if you're lucky, but you can't risk it. 
and then you'd have to put another role in and you may miss something. So now with digital, it's pretty much unlimited depending on the size of your, you know, your SD card or whatever. Um, I mean, obviously I, I shoot Nikon, so it's XQD. So, um, and then Max came across the line and then I just saw in the top of my corner, just like something go off and I didn't know what it was, but I kept my finger on the button. It was fast shutter speed. And it's actually the fireworks going off. So I went back through and went, God, that's amazing. So send that back. And then that was the firework picture. I put that on Instagram and the Dutch went completely mad on it. It got like seven and a half thousand likes on Instagram, which was huge for me at that particular point last year. And I thought, oh, I can't choose between the two. <laughs> so I decided to pick both of them. So, so I actually picked both, both pictures and got them signed by Max at um, Hungary the next race i got them printed signed and took them to the next race got all approved by red bull it's for charities anyway and actually gave some to the wings for life which is their uh, disabled charity that they do for, for sports people that have been injured and uh, are disabled now so that was great to do that for them as well but so i guess in terms of each year it's nice to have one particular picture that, that that's sort of i guess iconic photo of that year and I've, I've, I've been looking back through the years and picked out some of those pictures which obviously I've been trying to post on Instagram you know whether it's from the British Grand Prix or whatever you know that there is a lots of iconic photos from each year it's difficult to pick out one I'd probably say that the most famous one is the flying fin again because it only because of, of, of the height he's got and mm. because it was on film mm. And it was the shutter speed and that particular moment. Nobody else got it. I was there with 10 other photographers and nobody else <clears> got it. Yep. Excuse me. I do actually speak to one of the photographers that was next to me. He's called Terry Griffin. He lives in, he lives in San Francisco. I went to see him last year, actually. And he, we still talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I got the photo and he didn't. He's got after. So he's got him hitting the ground, which is still quite a nice photo. I've actually got that as well. Is that shot a sequence? But um um, it's not the same as being in the air. So yeah, he, he, he still goes on about it. It's quite funny. Um, and then one of the other photographers that I still remember is Pascal Rondeau, a famous French photographer. I think he lives in Le Mans. I think he lives inside the track in Le Mans. Yeah, wow. He's quite a famous uh, French photographer. He didn't get it either. He was shooting at 60th and he didn't get it. Maybe because of the shutter speed, I don't know. But, um, but I have actually seen it now on the Motorsport uh, Images website. They've actually got a shot from above because there was a hospitality unit behind us and they've actually got a shot from above, but it, it, it's no way near the same because ah, you can't tell he's in the air. <laughs> you can't, you can't see any real air to it, you know, and this one, I'd say it's, you know, three or four feet in the air. People say it's meters, you know, people say it's five or six feet, eight feet, whatever, but um, I guess it's up to you. But there's another great story about that was that, for the advertising campaign next year for Rothmans. So obviously Senna went to Rothmans Williams next year. They used that photo as the pitch for the photographers. Mm. They said, this is what we want. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they want. They want the photographers to create that photo uh, as their advertising pitch. So it, that was quite an honor to have that in, included, but they're not gonna get that again, are they? I mean. Those pictures happen once in the in your lifetime, really. You know, and it's it's very rare that you'll get it again. I think also because of safety, you know, they've changed the curbs, and that was a particular moment, that particular corner. I've been back to Adelaide, and they don't use that part of the track anymore. I was there, I was there for the Clipsal um, 400, 500, whatever it's called. I was there last year, but I wasn't doing the V8s. I was working for Audi. So it was great to go back last year, um, back to Adelaide for the first time in 20 years. Uh, mm. Great, crazy. Uh, yeah, it was a really nice experience. But yeah, going on from your question, I think, I think it's very difficult to pick out one moment. It would be the, probably the flying fin. We talked about it already. Um, but the other moments, I'm, I'm, I'm building this sort of moment of the year, which is great. And whether it's mm. for charity or not, um, it's great to, you know, to give something back to charities. And I'm doing a lot with dementia, uh, cancer, and children's charities so that's that's great as well because I'm, I'm privileged to be in this sport that I love but to know a lot of people and it's it's quite easy for me to get things signed for, for things like this so it's great yep. so turning to the other side the not so amazing moments yep. um, I know that uh, you were there that uh, weekend obviously with Ratzenberger um, and Senna and you got some yeah, of the yeah. last photos and some pretty haunting photos of uh, Senna and yeah, Schumacher yeah. and all that. 
would that be oh. sort of your your least memorable? Yeah, it's memorable, but your least sort of the lowest. Yeah, sort of it was a difficult weekend because we were. Yeah, because we were we were working for Williams as well. I mean, that was the and we worked for Simtech as well. So and Roland was a really big friend of ours because um, he actually. I mean, the tragic thing. I'll show you this now. It's 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 pretty incredible. I found this pack of business cards, and I didn't know whose they were, where they were from, and they were literally in my memorabilia. And I was going through them, <clears throat> and I found one particular um, one particular business card. I'll find it in a sec. Um, and it and it's Roland's business card. Can you believe wow. it? He used to, he lived in the next village. So we we were based in Toaster when it was Sutton. Um, when it was Sutton Images or Sutton Photographic. So just to give you an idea, so that's my business card, um, Sutton Photographic at Three Islington Road. That's where we were originally based. And that was my business card in the early days. Um, actually, it's probably not the, the first business card, but anyway. And then, yeah, I'm trying to find it now. It's probably not, I probably won't be able to find it if I mentioned it. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was just bizarre. I was going through these business cards. I mean, there's this one here. Look at this guy, Johnny Dumfries. He's now the Earl of Dumfries. Crazy, yeah. isn't it? Business card of his. Crazy. Mauricio Guzman. He was a Formula One driver, but not racing in Formula One at that particular time. Hugh, Hugh Rothengatter. He was a he was a Formula One driver. But yeah, so going through these business cards was quite. I can't find it now. Oh, there we go. Yeah. I mean, that is just. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that yeah. crazy? So he lived in a place called Blakesley. Now we had our office in Toaster, as you could see. And that's Blakesley, which was next to Toaster. And Roland was a really big friend of ours. I mean, I did quite a few shoots with him. We then became the Simtech photographers. And it was amazing to see him in Formula One. That was his goal in life. His, his, his whole goal about racing was really to get into Formula One. And obviously he struggled, you know, he, he was very good at racing. He was, but he wasn't, I would say the top driver, but um, he then went to Japan. I think Japan really helped him actually move up the ladder if any if any if any if anything you know i saw him there i did um i did a touring car race at uh, monza i did the world touring car race in monza i think 92 93 and um roland was there in the bmw team so i photographed him there and i did le mans obviously roland was there in le mans and it was great to see him when simtech happened and we had the contract and it was all amazing and we were doing photo shoots so we did a photo shoot with a bike i think even on that morning of the of the tragedy um but it was just so sad you know first of all there was the, the barrichello crash which was obviously was daunting nuts. and haunting it was so fast i'm amazed he got out of that car when you think about the side impact wasn't even there then you know mm. uh <clears throat> the cars were still strong because obviously they still built carbon fiber but the head protection wasn't really there but Rubens was okay and we were very lucky. But then the Roland thing was just tragic. And when you watch the Senna film, it's all there in that Senna film, isn't it? It's, it's haunting, really is haunting that film. Yeah. And um, brings back lots of good memories as well as bad memories. And obviously that day, I photo after having the Roland tragedy was just crazy. And obviously they pulled out. And, and then the next day, they hadn't had the driver's briefing. So they had another driver's briefing on that Sunday morning. And I remember photographing Senna on the way in. He was, people were pounding him for autographs and he was talking with Berger. And then when they left, they were going to normally would go down the paddock, but they decided to go down the pit lane because there was so much media waiting for them. And I, I followed him. There was, I think it was only a couple of us going down the, <coughs> excuse me, literally down the, down the pit lane they went, which was so unusual. And uh, yeah, there's that haunting shot. And they're not really looking like they wanted to race, to be honest. That, 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 that picture for me just says that they didn't want to race. And um Obviously, we know that Senna carried the, the Austrian flag in the car for Roland. And it was, um, I was actually at the next corner. I was at Toza corner. So I didn't really know what was going on. It was all in Italian. And I didn't really know that Senna had a big crash, to be honest. I, I, well, I knew he'd had the crash, but I didn't know whether it was a fatal crash or whether it was that bad. Obviously, when the helicopter came, but it was too late by that point. I could have gone then gone to see what was happening, but it was too late, to be honest. Some photographers did leave and go to the corner and, and, and took those shots, you know, of him being put in the helicopter or on, on the tarmac. I, I wasn't really interested at that point. But um, <clears throat> the one thing that will always stay in my, in my mind, really, is when Senna left in that helicopter. And 
it, it, there was hundreds of thousands of Tafosi on that Toza corner. So on the bank, on the exit of the corner, is this, it's just a tens of thousands of people. And actually, I've looked at the pictures of when the safety car was out and he was still there on track. And actually, look, and the people are all piled on the fence. They're on top of the fences as you go down up that hill out of Toza corner. And it just proved to me, and the one haunting memory is they all clapped. It was just, it was the helicopter taking off. And you see it in the film, the helicopter taking off. I just remember all the clapping. They literally just clapped him away. They didn't cheer. They just clapped as he, as he left in the helicopter. And that will stick in my mind forever, really. I mean, I'm talking about it now. So it's, it's still there. It's not many memories left in my mind, but that's one of them. And then the tragic thing then was obviously we carried on the race, did the podium. And people obviously didn't even know then at that point whether he was dead or not. And it, was, it wasn't really until I got to the airport. I then, I then was going actually back on the Williams flight. I was, we were actually on the flight where the Williams team were going back and it was, it was really horrible. Um, they were all taken to a room at the airport and told in this room in the airport. Um, and it was, they didn't know either at that point. So all the mechanics then on the fly, it was just, oh, it was a horrible flight back to England. And then obviously when they, when they landed, they all went on a coach and were escorted away because all the TV cameras were waiting for them when they got back. And obviously they didn't want to go through all that TV exposure and everything, but uh, it was, yeah, it was a tragic event and hopefully we'll never have it again. Obviously we were there for the Jules Bianchi crash and, Yep. I was there, obviously, at that corner. I was there that corner five laps before he had that, that crash. I'd then gone back to do the, what was the Park Fermi and podium. And I could see then that, you know, <clears throat> I remember shooting Max Max Chilton, as he because his teammate was Max Chilton. And I remember seeing the trainer and Max Chilton coming down the pit lane. I was actually on the balcony doing the podium. Um, but you could see everything going on from there. You could see everything that was happening in the, on, in the pit lane and on the pit wall. And you could see with Max's um, his mannerisms and the, his walk that he, he was not happy in a happy place, you know. So it was, uh, it was, it was, it was. That was a tragic weekend as well. That will stick in my mind. And I've been through quite a few. If you think about it, I've been there. I was there when Paul Warwick died tragically in Alton Park, and um, I've been to quite a few places where people have died, and it's been horrible. To be honest it's it's not the glamorous part of the sport i like really nice. um but it's racing you know motor race at the end of the day motor racing is dangerous um yeah. i mean they all do it for a buzz they all do it to be on that limit don't they they all they are literally on that limit when you watch the cars on track now the formula one cars they are just incredible the grip level is mind-blowing honestly you've got to be on the circuit really to, to realize you don't see it really i don't think on the TV pictures, you have to no, be there in real not. life. <laughs> but for me, that is, that is to see them at certain corners in, even in, even in Hungary, I'm thinking back now that there's one particular complex where they become, almost before they come, there's one particular shot before the, the water tower. You literally can walk down and you're literally barrier and they're on this curb. And it's, it's mind blowing. Probably shouldn't even be there to be honest, because they're, they're literally doing 180 mile an hour to 200 mile an hour. And they're on this curb and you've only got tires in front of you. There's no, there's no fence there luckily. And it's a lovely picture. And I was with another photographer from Getty Images and he said, are we, should we, should we really be here? <laughs> and I was thinking probably not. <laughs> and I didn't stay there for very long to be honest, but it's spectacular. The grip level is mind blowing now that, the commitment of the driver you, you, you really get to understand how they earn their money the, the commitment around the whole track especially for the top guys you do see the difference between the commitment between what is a Williams and a Mercedes I'm not saying it's necessarily that the driver it's probably the car that the level that the, that driver can commit is is probably based on what he thinks the car will give him yeah. um, to me, that's what it feels like. But certainly the Mercedes is, is mind-blowing. The Red Bull as well, is, is Max in particular, is, is totally committed to those corners. You know, watching them around the circuit is, is mind-blowing. Um, and, and Monaco. Monaco is probably my favourite. If you're gonna, I'm probably going to ask me this question in a minute. What's my favourite track? But <laughs> it would be Monaco. 
it would be Monaco because Monaco of the... from that question. So <laughs> <laughs> you did really, yes. But it, 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 it's sort of got everything in one. Really, it's got the commitment level. You haven't yeah. got necessarily some of the speed, but going up from from what is you know um, the first corner up that hill towards Casino Square, the commitment mm. going through there compared to the old days is mind blowing. And then even in Casino Square, it, it's the grip level is bonkers you know um obviously when you go to get to the hairpin what is the fairmont hairpin or the lowe's hairpin whatever you want to call it um it's literally just turn the wheel and you're around the corner but the quick corners even in monaco are mind-blowing but things places like eau rouge in spa is is bonkers it's just literally bonkers but the drivers love it and even 180r in in suzuka they love those those corners that are all just on the limit of grip level commitment of just taking it you know no rouge now is flat it's literally just flat they don't lift off you know you look back at some of the old videos i think they were lifting off maybe maybe not even going down a gear but coming maybe in sixth gear or seventh gear now they're in eighth gear flat it's literally bum, 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 up you know it's it's crazy absolutely mm. crazy but it's it's an amazing experience to be there you have to be there and to be there as a photographer is 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 amazing. You know, it's just incredible. Um, and that's what you see with the passion that I've got, you know, to, to show that. You don't see it really as a TV. I, I don't think you see it as TV. I think to be at the circuit, to even for the spectators to watch it beside the track. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry that they're not there this year. But, um, but next year, hopefully, we're all going to be there and there'll be even more spectators. I think there will be. I think yeah. the, the, the love of the sport and their... Their, um, their sort of hunger to get back on the track will will possibly double the amount of people that can come to a race because their, their passion to come back, having watched it on TV, is not the same thing. You know, they want to be there. They want to even touch the drivers or whatever if they're allowed to. But <laughs> we'll see. But um, uh, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk about COVID anymore. It just bores me. But anyway, mm. uh, but <clears throat> yeah, I think really going back to your question, I can't even remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> You've answered it. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever it was, it, it was yeah. Monaco, or it was, it was passion. It was, it was, it was, um, it was which circuit is your best? I don't know, but yeah, yeah. Oh, right, look, I'm going to hand oh. you over to Brent uh, for a couple of questions. Okay. Um, and he's then got me some we'll technical come... questions. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know what he's got. Um, you can't ask him if he's single. <laughs> clearly a married man. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, looks like he's done his hair, though, especially. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we'll come back for a last couple of questions and, okay. um, yeah. Yeah, no problem. We'll talk to you then. Yeah, awesome. No, oh, cool. Um, yeah, and absolutely agree. Uh, we're quite lucky here in, in WA. Our motorsport kicked off a little bit earlier than the rest of the country because um, sure. we've been, we're a little bit remote and we've been a little bit insulated from the COVID stuff. Mm. But the, you know, the last two state level race meetings we've had, the, the, hills have been filled like it's something i haven't seen really? in my time in wa it's been really good awesome. yeah, um, yeah so i'm hoping you'll see that you know as soon as crowds are allowed back at the f1 at you know all the bigger series the sports car racing and that you'll see yeah, you will i think you i think all sports will yeah we'll see a huge reaction from not going to want to go because it, it just creates that doesn't it i think it will create that i know we've still got the tv coverage and obviously all the the media coverage in terms of of images and obviously reporting but it's not the same thing as being there at a track and just experiencing you know speed and noise and and yeah. um and, and getting close to the drivers i'm obviously you know we're not getting that close to the drivers even as a photographer but um yeah i think that's what we want in the future obviously next year hopefully we'll be back so absolutely um so yeah um technical questions as far as technical photography questions it's not yeah. That's what, that's not me. That's why I have gurus like Shane around. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I did go out to a few um, fans and, and, you know, people that admire your work and ask some questions and okay. you know, so we're going to interview this guy's decent legend. What do you, what do you, do you reckon? And I got asked one is, so you've been in motorsport for a long time. Your Instagram, there's some ripper photos of, of the heyday and you getting around in shorts and a t-shirt and a bum bag and, you know that that sort of stuff. What what are some of the evolution of changes that F one has made the safety of photographers? Um, 
Yeah, I know yeah, I think, in the hot spots it's it's got quite intense for you guys now. So I think I think in terms in terms of safety, obviously the, the in terms of the safety at the tracks, it's obviously more the fences they've put up, and obviously the new tracks, obviously they've put they've put more runoff areas. So that's made it worse in terms of shooting more with long lenses. In terms of the spectators, again, you've got the fences that are blocking them from taking the shots. But I would always say to spectators, try and get the height if you can. If there's any way you can get the height, whether it's in a grandstand, you can sometimes get above what is the fence. That, for me, is the key bit. I mean, there's a guy that shoots that was shooting actually in Barcelona at the testing. His name's David Gibson, Motorsport. <coughs> Excuse me. He was... Um, he shot some amazing photos considering he's outside the track um, and he's still posting on his Instagram, uh, but he got some great positions, you know, just by using walking around and obviously knowing the track a little bit and maybe it's worth going. If you get a chance using that first day, just to walk around the whole circuit, pick out your best positions, mark them on a map like I would do. I mean, I've actually got um, just to give you an idea. I haven't got one that's marked here, but that's, that's, that's just, I always keep the maps. Um, I always keep here's, here's the one from Mexico, <laughs> but I would normally go around this circuit with the track walk and mark the positions. You haven't got one here that's marked, I'm afraid. It's probably in, in on my memory video, but <clears throat> even if you can get one from Google, just get the one from Google Earth and then print it out, take it with you, mark it up where the best positions are, maybe for light, for height, for certain shots. Excuse me, so just use that first day as your recce day, as you could say. And then work out where you're going to go around the circuit, what lens it's even going to be at that particular time where the light is. I think it's also about the light, utilising where the light's going to move. So for, from arriving at nine o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night, it's completely changed, doesn't it? It's become what was a, a beautifully lit shot to a backlit shot, but maybe you want that. But you mark it on the map and then utilise that. I think that's what's happened that's what I do at the moment in terms of photography. Um, in terms of spectators and obviously getting access, it's very difficult in terms of getting accreditation. Uh, but obviously, if you work for a newspaper, magazine or website, websites are becoming more acceptable now in, in terms of the media because they're obviously that's where everyone's looking for news, you know. So and in terms of images, they want they want images. So <clears throat> excuse me. So I think that's a great avenue in terms of moving forward. But obviously set up an Instagram account. I think social media is a big part. You know, you mentioned my social media. And obviously that's grown from what is zero to 100,000 now. Uh, fans are interested. Fans want the story as well. They want to know where you went. They, they want to follow where you've been. Follow you arriving at the track or maybe not eating the breakfast <laughs> in this case. But, um, but they want... It seems to be baked beans, sausage, um, <laughs> grilled mushroom and you know, this breakfast. proper breakfast with you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I think we will get that at Silverstone. Hopefully, I'm fingers crossed we'll get that at Silverstone. You'll see it on my Instagram because <laughs> yeah. normally they lay on quite a good breakfast for, for, for the media. But anyway, let's not go there. But, um, you know, so, yeah, I, th I think in terms of social media, it, it's created a great platform that's free for people to promote their brands or promote themselves and show what they can do. I mean, look, it doesn't really matter whether it's motorsport or not, you know, even if it's your family or... Like I said before, you know, go and shoot local events, no matter what they are, uh, whether it's cricket, whether it's football, whether it's whatever. Just, I think a lot of people say to me, how do I get to Formula One? It's very, very difficult nowadays. It's been, it's been so, it's getting restricted and it's even more restricted now. There's only 20 of us there and it, I can't see it changing throughout the whole of this year, I'm afraid to say. But, um, but in terms of getting access, you know, you can get more access to local events, karting events in particular. If you want to learn about motorsport photography, that's where you want to start in karting, really. And then from there, you can go to single seaters like Formula Four, Formula Ford. Um, they'll have local events, even go to a test day. I mean, Silverstone has general test days. Pretty much, I used to go pretty much every Friday. We, we were next door to Silverstone Circuit, where our office was. And I remember going, you know, to test days all the time just to just to see new cars or, or even you might even find that the guy who's got a racing car there has got an incredible supercar, you know, go and photograph that in the car park. That could create a huge buzz on your social, me social media just from that. But obviously to get on track, you, you know, you need, a, you need some sort of accreditation. And that's, that's a little bit more difficult, but go and shoot from the spectator area. I'm sure you can get in the circuit. Um, but for me, it's, it's shooting every day that makes you better. A bit like being a, a driver, you know, the drivers, 
never really stopped over the COVID period. They, they were either on the simulators, they were going karting, they started to do karting towards the end when it became a little bit more eased. Um, but they were trying to keep occupied with their mind, you know, but also I think as a photographer, you want to keep busy. I was shooting birds in my garden, not the, feather, the feathered variety. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there was magpies, there was, there, was, um, there was woodpeckers, there was robins, there was various different birds. I, I put a load of bread out so to bait them, uh, but it was great. I spent about two or three hours photographing all these birds, but I was bored, you know, I just, and I could see them. I've got a couple of um, hanging, you know, one's got nuts and seeds on it, and I could see them hanging there. The, the woodpecker in particular was hanging upside down, yeah, it was amazing. And I just, I was shooting through glass. I shot through my, because if I'd have gone outside, I knew they would have all gone away and never come back. So I shot through the glass of my conservatory. And that was just a great way of just keeping occupied, really. I mean, obviously, I, post, I posted that picture of me shooting the first eSports Formula One race. And that was just yeah. a wind up, really. I put my tabard on from Australia and pretended to shoot it. I didn't really shoot it. I, I did well, the I did, same. <laughs> the, pictures, the pictures were pretty pathetic, to be honest. <laughs> but it created, it, it's number, number two, I think, in my Instagram. <laughs> it gets like 8,000 likes or something stupid. But, and uh, people like CNN were using it on their website. It was, it was bonkers. But I was just, I was bored, you know, I just, and I thought the first Grand Prix coming on, I'll, 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 I'll get ready for it, <laughs> like, like the Grand Prix. So I put my tab on, I've got my tab on here, I've got my tab on here from Melbourne, and I put that, I put my Melbourne tab on, and um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was great to see um, the reaction. I put my pass on, but you couldn't really see my pass because it's around my neck, and then I got my daughter to shoot a picture of me sort of kneeling down, shooting the TV screen, yeah, that was quite a good one. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, what was your question again? <laughs> I've gone completely. Oh, no, so the, yeah, the question was initially, you know, how, how has it de uh, evolved and what's changed with safety? And you, know, you oh. mentioned it's just that well, much harder to shoot because of the, the barriers and the fences. Yeah, and, I think, I think yeah. safety is one thing, but also how everything's changed from when I started. I think that's the key bit for me. I mean, I, I, you've got to remember, I, sh I talked about the Senna and Brundle thing, talked about my first race, you know, processing so i was processing in a tank a little tank you could have a three spool so you used to load your film in the dark in, into a spool and then process in a tank with chemicals you pour it in obviously hot chemicals and then and then from there you would then wash it dry it and then print so we're printing in dark rooms with enlargers onto black and white paper and then we sent all the prints out on spec i mean literally we were, there was no guarantee we would get any money it was only if we got something that was special, like like the crash or anything of incident, that you actually got things published. But it meant you were pushing your pictures out to that agency every, you know, so in this case, magazines more than anything uh, around the world, you know, every, every week. And then obviously we went on to colour. So in those early years, we we're all black and white. Went on to the colour film, which I showed you before, which was this. This was originally this Velvia film. In, I mean, we were shooting that sensor as well because it was 100 ISO. This is only 50 ISO, so very low ISO, but the quality was incredible. The grain, the grain was really fine on this. And we pushed it to 100 just to give us a bit more depth of focus, really, in most of the pictures. You know, you'd shoot 500 in most cases on those film cameras, 500 at F8, that's what it was. <laughs> but you had a light meter as well. You carried a light meter, you've probably seen it. You put your light meter up to the light, it gave you an exposure. Gave you gave you a uh, exposure to put in your camera, so 500 for f8 or 7.1 or whatever, and that's how we started really with film. Then we got all these processed at a lab, and then that, that progressed onto we actually had a lab in our office. So in Toaster, we bought a chapel. We then put our first uh, photographic lab into the office, and that meant we could process 24 hours. So then we employed someone to run the lab. It was QLab trained by Kodak. Um, and then they could run 24 hours a day. Then we started doing the duplicates. So from the originals of these, I haven't got any here, so any uh, pictures on transparency, but uh, we would then obviously duplicate. So like with the flying fin, we had 50 duplicates made, but we did that then in our office. So what we did then was from, from the Grand Prix, we'd come back, make a selection of our best pictures. And in the beginning, it was 20. We just literally just picked 20 pictures. We made the selection of 20, then we duplicated them in the beginning, say 10 times, they went out then to 10 magazines. So rather than sending those originals, we sent the duplicates. And then that became bigger. We went from 20 to 40. And then you did more dupes. So then you went, 
eventually we yeah. were doing nearly six to eight thousand dupes a grand prix it was bonkers and we had almost 60 clients so then we had a rack system where we put all the dupes into this rack system for all the magazines all the the packs went out on the monday by dhl we had 36 dhls going out around the world and then some went by post it was bonkers it was really was and then we had a massive lab we had 25 excuse me i'm losing my we had 25 staff in the office doing all the duplicates. So we had dupers. We had, then we had mounting machines. So we had mounting machines that, that, that cut. So you load in the film or the duplicate film, it then cut it, mounted it. And then we had the captioners, which captioned the actual mount. It was, it was like a factory. It was bonkers. Um, but it was an amazing period. And we had so many staff. I didn't even know all the names. It was that many people. We were employing so many people because it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It was crazy. And then, obviously, then digital came in. And then the levels just swapped the other way, really. It became that we needed more photographers, but we needed less staff because the whole process mm. was changing. And then, obviously, we got to a point where the camera became so good. So we shot film. And we shot digital at the same time. And then it got to a point where we shot only digital when the camera became a certain level. <clears throat> and then the next step going from that was then how do we get those pictures to the clients? And then it was obviously transmitting the pictures. Firstly, it was on a modem by modem to the, to the clients directly or to the office and they sent them or we uploaded them to them. Then it became a website. So 96 1996, we started the Sutton website, um, Sutton-images.com as it was. And that became huge because then it meant the clients could actually download the pictures. So everything just changed so much, so but so quick. It, it seems like it wasn't that quick, but it was very quick in those digital periods. Mm. Mm. And then the next step was, how do we send the pictures directly from the camera? And I was probably the first person to, to do this. Um, I actually did a deal with Batelco in, um, in Bahrain. They had this MiFi device, which I've still got somewhere. Um, it's similar to this one I've got here. This is an upgraded version now. This is Huawei advice. So this one basically transmits your picture. So you connect your camera to this device. This is on 4G. We'll go to 5G, very, hopefully very soon. But this is on 4G. Probably originally it was on 3G. And then what you do then is it's, it's connected all the time. So when you pick the picture, you select tag when it's tagged it sends so it's sending in the background and you can carry on shooting <clears throat> the next probably step is that you'll wire this in you can wire that into a cable and you can send every picture but 4g at the moment isn't quick enough um, you could maybe have a wi-fi system around the circuit or you could have a cable connected from a box around the circuit but i know there is some people doing that for other reasons but we won't go into that uh, so that is the way I send my pictures at the moment. From, it's from a transmitter on the camera. So we literally now, from the last three races, we've sent every picture back from the transmitter. And then the, you have editors back in England waiting for the pictures to come in. So you, you literally have one photographer with one editor. It's because there's so many pictures coming in. That's what it's got to. Um, so the, the way the agency works now is, is, is probably at the optimum at the moment. The next step is, as I said, it will be literally every image going back and i know getty do that now at the olympics already but they do it on a wired system they'll put 15 kilometers of cabling in and they did that at the um, winter olympics i think in sochi they literally put cables in for everywhere so when you're working at an event you plug it in and it's sending every frame you don't you don't need to pick your pictures then the editors pick them so it's taking a little bit away from what you do because i like to pick the ones so say they didn't pick the one with the the golden moment say they didn't pick the spark picture say they didn't pick the one with the with with the fireworks you know what i mean that's that's where you really have to rely on the editor and that i'm not sure i like it <laughs> i'm not sure I'm, no. i like that but it's difficult to, to to move to the next step isn't it um i've already moved so many times from from dish pro i was dish processing my prints so literally it was a it was a it was a dish of chemicals where you saw it appear in front of you and that has changed so much in, in, I think we'll go back to your 38, 40 years because I was, pro I was processing and printing my, my son's, uh, my son's, my brother's, um, <laughs> brother's prints when it was Santa in 81. So, but 83 was my first year of actually shooting pictures. So, uh, but yeah, it was, it's changed so much, uh, but changed for the better. 
but I, I still think it's lost a little bit of its artist, artistic side. Um, when it was filmed, you didn't know what, you, what you'd shot. You didn't know if you got it right. You know, like with the flying fin, you know, when we saw that on the light box and we were going through them and we we're going through each picture, and um, my brother went, oh my frigging God, that's incredible. You know, it's just, it's that one moment that you're trying to look for and you didn't know you got it. Um, now you sort of look on the back of the camera, oh, it's okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> a bit blasé, like I was talking about before, but um, when you do get a special moment, it is, it is amazing. And it's, it generally it's a crash or a particular thing that's happened on the track, you know. Um, and you've gone there for a particular reason to shoot that, whether it's sparks or whether it's, in this case, a fireworks, you know, so. Okay, anything so else? With, would you like to well, yeah, well, so with the, um, you know, the way everything's evolved, you know, and, and it, when you when you when you walk through that process from, um, you know, developing in a tray, sort of like we still did that when I was at high school, so it can't make make me feel old now, Shane. <laughs> You're um, old. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, you know, all the way through, and then you had that uh, moment where you had all the uh, business cards from '94, you know, from the uh, drivers, team owners, managers, that sort of stuff. Oh, how how is the communication piece go these days? Is it all? Is it it's all email. It's all email. Yeah, it's all email and, and Facebook. What's happened? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, it's... Or is it still changed. a personal I mean, I still touch? Have, I, still, I still have business cards, of course, you know. Yes. But obviously, um, things have just changed, I guess, for the better in, in, in terms of communication and social media. Probably nothing in it. No, it's nothing. <laughs> That's my business card. There's nothing in it. I don't use it anymore, but there is some around around somewhere. In. Uh, yeah. So yeah, things have changed. I mean, for the better, really. I mean, obviously now you can put the pictures, you know, in terms of the picture quality and the putting pictures online for the clients, it's great because they get the pictures so quickly. You know, like I was saying about the water tower picture that I shot mm. in Hungary, you know, I've got every frame of every car and I was sending every frame as they came through and I was repeating some of them because I didn't know what I'd send. And that, that's the problem when the cars are going out a lot, this is the problem when the cars are on track. The, o the only sticking point about this tag and send is keeping up with it. That, that is the difficult bit. Whereas if you could send every picture and let an editor do it, it's slightly different. And what I found was that you do lose track of where you were and to go back is very difficult. But I sent pretty much every team. And then when I got back to the wire room, I started looking on social media and every picture was already on every team website. <laughs> so yeah. it, it, it proves something for me that communication has improved and they, the teams are totally switched on with it and they're utilizing what you've got in terms of connection, in terms of speed and getting those pictures online. So McLaren had the picture online, Haas, Pirelli, Honda, you know, whatever who we work for, but, um, and Racing Point, they all use that shot with, with the water tower, which was, I know it's, I would say personally, it's a boring picture, but it's so synonymous with, with Hungary. It's the classic photo. It's like I said, it's been yeah. there since the nineties or eighties, whatever, when they built it. Um, the town's got bigger, um, uh, but it was a lot Pirelli. You couldn't do some of the shots you did in the nineties because there's more branding. That's, that's the difficult part. It's trying to do some of these shots without the branding to keep some of the clients that don't want the branding in. So the magazines don't generally want lots of advertising. Um, yeah. but you've got to, but then you've got to do a mix. So you've got to do a mix with the sponsors like that corner was totally Pirelli. I mean, it, it was bonkers Pirelli everywhere. Um, and Liberty now, obviously I put, I, I think Liberty are putting more advertising out because there's no, there's, first of all, there's no fans there. So they can, they've got more space and also they're trying to keep those sponsors happy because, um, obviously they're the people that's bringing in the revenue, the sponsors and the TV are the only two people that are bringing in revenue to keep the teams going, to keep the drivers happy. And then <clears throat> obviously we're the ones that's pushing it out for the teams, but also pushing it out to the media. Obviously Autosport magazine will have published quite a lot of my pictures, motorsport.com and autosport.com are obviously pushing, pushing, you know, the pictures into their galleries, whatever, and stories, news stories. So like with the Max, when he damaged his wing, I didn't get any shots of his damaged car, but I saw the wing being brought down the pit lane, as you saw. And that was a really key picture for me. I was actually doing the, the national anthem and the kneeling picture. I was privileged to be in the pit lane for the first time of the weekend. Uh, but obviously everything happened in front of us. I got all the, it was great shots of the mechanics walking towards me as well. And, and obviously that, that wing was in particular, that was a great shot. 
and I just kept my finger on the button and got some technical pictures as it, as it went past as well. So it's, it's not always, you know, I, I think the technical side is, is important part as well. You know, the technical pictures, I, I don't work, I'm not a spy photographer. I don't work for any teams or anything like that. But obviously we've got Giorgio Piola. Giorgio Piola is part of the motorsport network and he, he's, he's the expert on all the technical side of it. And he'll give me a list of the things he wants me to shoot technically of the cars and I'll try over the weekend to do that. Um, but obviously getting some shots of that wing was great because they've got this new nose yeah. with, with the air intakes and everything. So it was, it was really, it was an opportunity you couldn't miss. First of all, the drivers, so first of all, so the mechanics with the wing, but then trying to shoot some technical shots while you're at it is what it's all about really. So it's a, it's a mix of the two. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, man, we're like, the, the stories are fantastic. We're, you know, we're chewing through time, something chronic, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, like I said, I went out and asked some, some of my spies in, yeah. in the community and in the industry, uh, uh, you know, um, and I've got one from, from a, um, you know, uh, one of our expats, I suppose you'd say. Yeah. Um, okay. but he wants to know what your favorite, uh, UK trackers and he says you've had some ripper shots from the bomb hole at Snedderton. So I don't know that track myself, but yeah. We're talking about a long time ago though. <laughs> this guy's a Saki yeah, Mike as he's known, he's a he's a long timer. Yeah. I mean I did the um well one amazing stat was I did the Le Mans twenty four hours, came back to the UK and then did the Will Hire twenty four hours. I did yeah. two twenty four hour two twenty four hour races back to back. <laughs> Well, I actually camped. I camped in Snetterton, in inside the um, media car park. Uh, but the bomb hole, yeah. I mean, I, obviously, I covered all those Formula Three events and Formula Ford and touring cars during those early years. So I did, you know, I did Brands Hatch, Donington, Mallory Park, Cadwell, Snetterton, uh, Thruxton. I've done all these tracks. Um, I mean, it's difficult. I, I would still say that Alton Park's my favourite because that's my local track, really. Um, and they've still got the gate there. So they've got this famous gate that's sort of at the end of the track and you can shoot the car against it. And there's not many, you know, landmarks around certain circuits. You can get things behind it. And that's what we're always looking for, I think, in Formula One. You know, whether it's the tower in Bahrain, whether it's whatever, you know, at certain tracks in Monaco, obviously it's the yachts, it's the, yeah. it's the swimming pool. It's where every corner you go to, it's the casino, whatever you go in Monaco, it's everywhere, isn't it? But, um, and obviously everything's famous, you know, the, the, the Mirabeau corner and you just carry on as you walk around. It's the semi corners famous, but obviously in Alton Park, you've got that gate. Um, I think it's called old, is it old, old gate? No, it's not old, old gate because old, old is the first corner. But anyway, the gate's very famous and that's an incredible photo to take there. The first corner is amazing. They, I think they took down the motor bridge, which used to be quite famous in all the pictures for the start. But, um, but for me, the gate is very famous. Um, I mean, I would say Alton Park for me personally. I did love going to Thruxton. I thought Thruxton was great because it had that chicane right at the end. And I thought that always created tension and created accidents and always battles into that. It was a long straight and then into the chicane and that always created great overtakes coming into there. Um, even in touring cars, I remember that. Um, where else? Donington Park. I mean, Donington to go there for the Grand Prix in 93 was amazing to see Senna win that what was probably one of the most iconic laps ever in Formula One um, to, to start mm. from sixth and then take all those cars on that one lap was just amazing. Um, and to be there for the Grand Prix and then to work with Donington quite closely with, there with, the, with the museum and to get to know the owners and everything was, was quite amazing. Uh, so yeah, they've all, yeah. Been, they've all been special tracks really and for their own reasons. You know, um, I've got a really famous picture of Roland, um, I think in Mallory Park where he's jumping in the air in the Formula Ford car with Roland yeah. Rat on the car, you know, because he was he was associated with Roland Rat here in the UK. Yeah. You know, GM, GM TV had this his rat that used to talk with a puppet. Yeah. <laughs> Madness, but anyway, yeah, yeah. that's an old school. No, but yeah, it's all, it's awesome. Roland got associated with him. But um, yeah, so things like that, really. I mean, um, Brands Hatch, I think, is a great track as well. I love Brands Hatch. Oh, um, a, I actually had a car on top. I had a car on top of me in Brands Hatch. Really? Yeah. On uh, Paddock, Paddock Hill Bend, yeah, a car landed. Luckily, it's, it's a bank, so it landed on between the fence and the bank, and I was underneath it. Uh, Jeez. Yeah, Formula, Ford, Formula Ford 2000 car. That was probably my lucky escape, to be honest, um, in, national, in national racing, yeah. I, 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 fuel literally dripping on me, so it, wasn't, it was a bit scary. Uh, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> these things happen. These have, as a photographer, 
you are in dangerous positions, mostly. And as we talked about before, you know, you were saying about safety. Now with the fences and the barriers, you know, you are pretty much safe. You know, in, in to give you an example, in Melbourne, they've improved the safety for the photographers by putting these special fences in that have got fences to stop anything going out from the outside. So something could still come in, but it'd be very small. No tires get in there anymore. And, but they're very difficult to shoot and they're very limited. I, I find them very restricted, but that's the way it is. And I, mm. there's some tracks you love going to because there isn't those restrictions. Austria is an amazing track because it hasn't got the restrictions. Hungary, again, is, is one that's not so restricted in terms of shooting. Yeah. They've put a few more fences up, but Monaco's become over-fenced as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's too much. But there is one particular place I go to on the last corner. I can touch the cars as they go past. I don't. But, um, <laughs> and I can still shoot there with a, with a wide-angle lens. It's amazing. Absolutely oh. incredible to go, to go to that one corner and shoot still. Probably oh. be banned now because next year, because I've told everybody. But um, yeah, but anyway, yeah. So yeah, it's for me, it's it's about... Yeah, it's about history, but also it's about um, Brands Hatch in particular was, is a famous track. It's not used for Grand Prix anymore, but it still has national racing there. And some yeah. international racers still go there. But yeah, absolutely. It's a good, it's a good track. It's one of my favourite ones on the sim. I'll get there one day. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and just before I give you back to Shane, I just wanted okay. to really compliment you on the your Instagram. You're saying your son runs it for you or does, it, does no, a lot I, of the social stuff for you. It's, yeah, I mean, he started to do a little bit, but he's... I'm trying to get him back on it because <laughs> I oh, obviously okay. during the weekend I'm, I'm posting the pitch. So the pictures are back live back on the site, but it, it's difficult to post when you're working. That's the, that's the problem, you know, but it would be great to have somebody could do that for me because obviously he, he's got the experience. He did two, he was two years working at motorsport network yeah. doing the motor. He did the autosport account and motors, um, a little bit of motorsport, but he mainly did autosports count. Um, yeah, doing a pretty all good that eye post. for what? what yeah. I mean, I think also he, yeah, he's see, he seen me shooting. He knows nice pictures. He's very critical as well. He, he, he will criticise what I posted, saying, why didn't you crop it? Why didn't you adjust it like this? So it's quite funny listening to him. And he, yeah. even from Hungary, he came back and said, oh, here's my favourite eight, eight pictures from Hungary. Um, but I'd sort of stopped posting by then. But it was great to see that he'd actually been online and, and picked some pictures. And I had posted some of those. So... It was nice that he's involved. I'd, I'd like to see him involved more, but I'm not sure yeah, he's cool. he's 100% interested. But to, to do a bit of my social media would be great um, to yeah. boost it even more, to get towards 200,000. <laughs> Easy. Easy, yeah. We, we'll see. But, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's certainly a, a great way to advertise your um, – to, to advertise what you've done and, and obviously current pictures. You know, it, it's a great way with the story as well now, which obviously – it's sort of similar on Facebook um, through the actual Instagram story. You can go live on there and things like that. So I love to do the lives on the, mon on the Monday when I, Monday or the Tuesday, when I get back and just talk about why I like the pictures and the reasons and, and how the weekend was now mm. more than anything, because to explain to people with the COVID, how it's all working to explain to them sort of why the fans can't be there really. It's, it's cause it's, it's difficult for them to understand. I think. Mm. Cool. Great. Oh, well, thanks. I'll give you back to Shane before we run right out of time and he runs out of <laughs> room yeah. on the hard drives or the zeros and ones fall apart or whatever. <laughs> Going to need, um, need a few terabytes. Yeah. Uh, it's got, got plenty going on here. The, um, <laughs> the amount of video work and stuff, I like, just, yeah, it's insane. But um, look, the. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, Come. Pretty Come. much a lot of the stuff I was going to ask you, you've answered just naturally, which yeah. is fantastic. Um, sure. my last question is what are the plans for Mark Sutton in the future? How long are you going to keep Mark doing, yeah. doing this? And, you know, have you got a, an idea, you know, when you sort of decide it's time to hang up the walking boots and move to do I something I think the time else? to hang, yeah, I think the time when to hang up is when you're not, you're not actually happy anymore. You're not interested anymore. But at the moment I'm still massively passionate. I'm only 55. It, it sounds old, but I'm actually still got the same passion I had when I was when I was 20, really, when I first started. So, you know, 35 years later, I'm still still really passionate about what I do. I love every day. I love going to the uh, to the circuits, really. I mean, I'm, you know, I don't necessarily like working in this office, but 
Um, <laughs> if I have to do it, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. But that's just the way it is. I do love going from a memorabilia. I, I spent the lockdown, obviously, in this one bedroom, which had three wardrobes of memorabilia. And it was quite, after the lockdown finished, I then decided to go into the wardrobe and just empty it all out and just see what's actually in here and try and find my Formula One passes as well because they're all over the place. And I've got a lot in the loft, which I've not actually been in yet either. Uh, but I found, which was great, I found the Flying Finn, which is also here with a couple of Schumacher signed pictures as well, which was in the same wardrobe. And I've got some button ones here to go on the wall. So for me, it's just still, you know, it's still a massive passion. It's great to see these new kids coming in as well. I, I love the fact that Formula One is bringing new kids into, into Formula One. You know, obviously Kimi probably needs to retire because he's done enough. And it would be great to get somebody in there that's young and just wants a passion for the sport. I think he's lost his love for the sport, to be honest. That's what I feel at the moment. But I think, you know, the fact that there's all these new guys, there's Lando, there's obviously mm. Daniel Ricciardo still there. You've got uh, George Russell coming in. You've got Charles Leclerc. Obviously, Max is still young. He's been in like yeah. five years or six years, and he's still only like 23, isn't he? It's incredible. Um, I think and there's, and there's lots of new drivers. I've, I've, I've actually been doing Formula 2 and Formula 3 um, at these last few races because we've got a... Uh, how good a, is Formula 3 at the moment? The race in Formula 3? Oh, Close. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Formula 2 has become a little bit... Formula 2 are the, the two spread out a little bit. but yeah. It depends on the tracks, I think. I mean, Formula 3 has been incredible. I've been loving covering it and it's been it's been actually quite interesting going out even for practice sessions and qualifying and then doing the races and actually did the first podiums at the weekend which was great and um obviously to see the, you know the next Schumacher up there as well Mick Mick is I think lying third in the championship he's got a chance to be in that Alfa Romeo seat really I mean if he can win a couple of races I think he's he could really change his career uh, by winning one even just winning one race I think will change his career um he will be noticed for sure, maybe get a run in Abu Dhabi in the Ferrari or the Alfa Romeo again, and um, it will be amazing to see him in Formula One. I think he's got he's got the talent. I think you know you don't really know until they're in that Formula One car. You know maybe, maybe he needs maybe another year. I don't know, but we'll see. Maybe in the Alfa Romeo he'll he'll do amazing, amazing job. But the car is not brilliant, so it's difficult because you're sort of you're not seeing the full potential. You know it's a bit like with George Russell. I think Mercedes know he's bloody quick and that he's incredible driver but he, because the car's not very good he's although he did an amazing job in in hungary um uh, yeah. and you know i can potentially see him scoring points maybe in silverstone we'll see but i mean the engine's got the power hasn't it i mean it should it should be equal to mercedes why isn't it equal it's the aero isn't it as i'm guessing but um it's such a shame because george is a great guy as well he's just a normal person he's not changed one one bit He's just a normal, normal, down-to-earth guy. He's amazing. Um, and he's a good looker. I'm sure the girls love him for his looks. <laughs> like all the new drivers. I mean, there's not one ugly one there, is there? Come on. <laughs> oh, no, they're, all, they're all ultra, <laughs> ultra fit. And <laughs> well, they're ultra fit. But yeah, like the... I think some of them are quite wealthy as well. <laughs> yeah. Like when you're they're that fit, I don't think you can be ugly. Um, no, but do you no. think that... Yeah. Like, I think... Maybe we're just biased because Shane and I, you know, we live in WA, but I think Danny Avocado, bloody. Oh, Lost you. You went, you went mute. <laughs> How you went on to mute? I don't know. Yeah, no. That's good. No, it's fat fingers and I, yeah, hit the space bar. Yeah, Shane knows what I did. Hit one of those. Problem between fingers. Um, <laughs> Go on, no, say again. Danny Rick came on. Daniel yeah. Ricardo came on and he really broke yeah. the mold because at that stage it it was the the ultra serious stone face. Yeah, you know you're sort he's of become, yeah. he's become sort of my favourite driver really because because of his his personality. He, he's matured. You know, I posted just now some pictures from literally his first Grand Prix was at Silverstone in 2011 with the HRT team and I worked for HRT so I was able to follow him that day when he arrived at the track and got his seat fitting and. We did some photo shoots with him and it was a great weekend. And that's, that was a, a really good moment to, to get to know Danny. I didn't really know him that well before that, but obviously working for the team helped. And then obviously went to Red Bull. We got the belly flop moment and everything. But I just see him as a great personality. You can always see he's smiling, even, even though yeah. he's got his mask on now. You know, you, you, you know by his yeah, eyes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know by his, the way, he, I think also by his body language. His body language is amazing and he, he loves music. You can see him bopping around all the time, you know. And he's, even if it's his head bopping, it's his body. And for me, that 
is what Formula One needs. It needs personality. Absolutely. It really does need personalities. I think Lando and, and Carlos, a bit muted this year because it's more serious and COVID's destroyed that a little bit, which is a shame. And hopefully next year we'll have the Danny and Lando connection. Mm. Hopefully we know COVID, no, none of this shit, and we can, we can get on with the normal racing and, and get personalities back. You know, uh, It's difficult at this particular moment to have that. But when they go and do the interviews, I think with that wall, that wall for the situation, I think that's quite funny. But they're talking talking <laughs> to a computer. It's a bit bizarre. Uh, but he just he just he just takes the fun out of it. He, he takes the Mickey out of it more than anything. Uh, but yeah, he's a great personality. And I, I love taking his picture. I mean, I, I can't get in the pits or the garage. That's the problem. I only see him there at the press conferences, and it, he's even laughing and joking in that first press conference. He was he was messing around. Uh, but for me, it's just it puts a smile on my face, and that's what you got to do every day. You got to smile and keep happy. Um, I mean, obviously, my future is is, is with Motorsport Network, at the, as it is at the moment, and it'll stay there, you know, as long as I'm happy, really. Uh, but um, and I'm, I'm happy, you know. I'm, I'm still covering Formula One. I'm actually on track more than I've ever been in my life, you know, and it's great. I'm actually enjoying being on the circuit, you know, and doing action pictures, and and then mixing that with the press conferences and the, and the Park Fermes and the podiums. You know, it's been great. I've, I've actually loved it. Because um, when you're in the pits, you are restricted. You can't really do both. You are you are doing one or the other. Um, so it's been great to do that, and um, it's going to be interesting. Silverstone. It's going to be great weather at Silverstone. I've got um, I've almost got my plan in place already. Whether that's the right plan, I don't know. Uh, but the weather looks really good. Um, it's going to be a busy, busy day on Thursday with the track walk. Um, obviously, drivers arriving. We could possibly do that. I'm not sure. But certainly, track walk. Um, some technical pictures shooting into the garages. Hopefully. Um, obviously shooting advertising, shooting the layout of the circuit, then into the, maybe the press conference. And that's pretty much my day, really. Yeah. But um, I'm looking forward to it already, you know, maybe shooting the paddock if we're allowed to. But we've got to just, you know, be aware of what restrictions there are and just adhere yeah. to those. But we have to wear the face masks. The, the, may, the crazy thing, we have to wear the face masks all day. Mm. So I've got, I've got a pile of these things that I have to wear all <laughs> day. My wife's, my wife's actually um, retied it. So it's, a bit safer. Um, I don't need to wear it at the computer, but I'm pretty much like this. Oh, I've got it around the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> I, pretty much, I pretty much have to wear this all day because it's got this bit of wire in it. Uh, yeah. but I've, come, I've become more used to it, but wearing it around the track's not so nice. But, and in the rain was quite interesting, <laughs> wearing it in the pouring rain in, um, in Austria. In Austria, I was waiting for the F2 race to start for, for about an hour and a half on the circuit in the rain but look i had an umbrella so i carry an umbrella with me all the time in, in my camera back but uh, yeah, oh, yeah so yeah i'm looking forward to it i'm really really enthusiastic for silverstone it's a double it's a double header so it's not you know it's back-to-back -back races so the second race probably won't be as exciting we'll have to see what happens in the first race is it going to be a mercedes domination or we're going to see some other teams up there with them It'd be interesting to see but i think personally speaking yeah. of ricardo there's yeah uh, i was gonna say is speaking joe, ricardo, you know, just joe behind you got a yeah his dad up here we did an interview oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. He was out racing at Brabham. Uh, was it the BT6? Oh, was it? Yeah. So, yeah, um, BT Junior or something. Yeah. Wow, but it was, yeah, it's awesome. amazing the contrast of personalities. You know, Joe's very mellow. Yeah, a little bit mellow. <laughs> He's a yeah, very yeah. crazy guy. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think Daniel's also living the LA lifestyle, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, I know he lives in Monaco as well, but. He's got he's got the money now to spend and buy the pad in LA, a bit like yeah. Lewis, and buy the pad in Monaco. You know, live in Monaco a little tax for tax reasons. But and obviously goes back to his farm in obviously in Australia. Um, mm. Is that near Perth? Is it? I guess I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah about an hour and a half, two hours yeah. south. Yeah, it looked in, like he was in enjoying the, himself. Yeah, in lockdown, yeah. wasn't he? Oh, it's in yeah. all the middle of all the best <laughs> vineyards in the in the country. So yeah, he'd be loving it. I'm not sure he's a wine drinker. He's got this new beer. He's he's got his yeah. number three <laughs> beer now. I need to try. We need. He needs to send him out some media. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll put the request out. Daniel, send out the beer out in lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> I, need beer, I need some beer in my fridge. I've got a couple of photographers staying with me for the Grand Prix. I'm about, I'm about 25 miles from Silverstone Circuit, so I don't mind some people staying with me. It's quite camaraderie. We're all in the same bubble anyway. We're all working together, so we're going to have bar hopefully have barbecues on the Friday night because it's going no, to. No, in his sense of humour, you're going to get sent boxes of export, Shane. Oh. <laughs> Horrible beer. <laughs> that, that's a headache job, isn't it? That's yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your wine, your wines are beautiful. I mean, 
can't can't knock your wines. Some of the beers, not sure, but yeah. yeah. Number number three beer, we're going to try it. It's a French <laughs> beer, though, isn't it? Sorry, it's a yeah, weird, it's, it's a years. weird hooker, but I guess it's because of, it's because of the Renault link up, I guess. But next year, and we'll see what happens with uh, with with the McLaren link up. But um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. But Daniel's awesome. Daniel's awesome. One of the best. Yeah, I'm. Uh... Cool. Hopefully one day we'll be able to snaggle him to get onto this uh, chat, but uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can. But, um, yeah, look, we've right, been guys. chatting for two hours. Um, I mean, really, two hours? Shit, I yeah, need it's lunch. been two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I, was feeling, I was feeling my tummy rumbling. Yeah. It's not going to be a burger. It's going to be a nice salad. It's going to be a salad. Is that all yeah, right? Okay, yep, yep. <laughs> you will, you will, you make, will see it on my Instagram. and sausages, come on, you can do it. I need to do a promo for my Instagram. Yeah. Rhubarb. <laughs> at, at, at F1 Sutton. You're going you're gonna to cut that out now, aren't you? No, no. <laughs> no I've already tagged you in it a few times. But, uh... <laughs> and I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to add the photo of my lunch any minute. Yep. <laughs> well, just, you know, as it's long gonna as you're going to be a, da- a Danny, tag... Avocado, Danny, Avocado, Danny Avocado salad. <laughs> yep. <laughs> just after you've been on uh, at Behind the Sport podcast. <laughs> there you go. We're getting it as well. That's F1. We're just going to keep putting these on there. Yeah. <laughs> Great to talk to you guys. Hey, on what else we got? Uh, at Lux before, at Lux underscore performance, at Beardy Snaps. Yeah, we got them all. <laughs> Motorsport. If, if everyone wants to see any of the images of mine and all the guys that work with us, it's motorsportimages.com. Yeah. And obviously, th- there's actually a poster shop area as well. We can buy prints. Yeah. Um, but obviously getting them signed is a bit difficult at the moment. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the horrible bit, but you could save them up for next year. Yeah. Um, um, I, I haven't got anything. I mean, I haven't picked my picture for this year yet as yet, because I've not really feel like I've got the shot. But, um, it's a brilliant I'm website sure. though. The, the filtering ability to yeah, you know, exactly. select, yeah. you know, you can select something, you can say what year, what, what exactly. genre. That's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, it's, it's similar to what the Sutton site was, to be honest. It's copied a little bit the Getty site, but it's been built from zero and it's pretty impressive. It's got nearly, it's nearly 5 million pictures. We pretty, Sutton's pretty much had 1.4 million on our, on our website. So that was wow. all moved across um, from the FIPS and the Sutton archive into, into what is motorsport images. But also in there is, um, is obviously the LAT archive and that goes back to 1895. So that's got the auto car archive in it. So that's why it's got the, the older pictures of cars from the beginning. Then it's got the Rainer Schlegermilch, which is the German photographer who worked up to about three or four years ago, but he started in 62. And then you've also got um, Ercole Colombo, who was the Italian photographer, worked for Ferrari. So it's an amazing collection in one. And five million online and 26 million in their whole. They're still busy scanning them at the moment. So it's... Uh, and Georgia, all the Giorgio Piola's um, drawings are in there as well, which is, they're, they're back from the 70s. So it's, yeah, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah, well, I've done my promo bit now. That's all right. I've got my, I've got my little bit in, even though it's the same, you know, I mean, obviously it's going out on ours anyway, but. <laughs> but thank you very much for joining us. Um, I could my chat to you for another two, three hours, but uh, yeah, we've obviously yeah. got to keep we've the attention out. span. You have to cut it back. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. But, um, yeah, look, hopefully, My pleasure. Uh, yeah, back in Australia next year and hopefully might cross paths. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, enjoy, the enjoy the rest of the year. Um, stay safe. Yep. And, yep. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Peace Thank later. you very, very much. That was awesome. Cheers, guys. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you. Ciao. Cheers. Bye. Uh, holy crap, two hours. Thanks for uh, that lovely chat with Mark. Um, yeah, look. Could have spoken for hours on end. Uh, he's definitely someone that I've followed for a long time. Um, and, yeah, between him and Manuel, uh, who's a local West Australian photographer. So many stories. Um, you know, there's photos where uh, I think it was Mansell gave a lift to Senna, uh, back to the pits. Just so many iconic photos that that, that guy has mm. taken. Um yeah, it's just it's amazing. So, um, oh, there's just there's wicked ones on there. You jump on that that motorsport images side. I was scrolling through it the whole time. There's photos of um, him sitting next to Senna with his dad taking the photos. You know, like yeah, it's just crazy stuff that you know that 
you know, we didn't get into, I would have liked to get into some of the glory days story, you know, the behind the, the party stories, you know, that sort of stuff that made the motorsport yeah. legends that, you know, the guys are so restrained now they can't have, but I bet he got involved in all that. hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent. All right. Well, look, um, we are doing a bit of a giveaway. Uh, so yeah, check out the Facebook page. Um, it is for the, uh, Finky Desert Race cancelled poster and Ooh. stubby holder. So, um, cool. yeah, we'll be giving that away. Uh, I think I might have introduced this as episode 16, but we're actually episode 17. 17. That's right. Oh, well. We're going, it's going great, Guns Man. It's, it's cool that yeah. we just, yeah. Yep. I'm stoked. All right. Um, thank you. That's it. Um, yeah, can't really say much else. Uh, next week, um, might be a change of guest. We did have DJ Labshire lined up, um, but we might be getting someone else. Special. Yeah. Oh, me? No, not you. <laughs> <laughs> Different kind of special. <laughs> um, yep. So anyway, keep an eye out. Uh, make sure you've subscribed everywhere, followed everywhere, done all that lovely stuff. And we will see you next week, episode 18.